Greetings, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for creating time to sign up and uh, be part of this amazing Pi and AI webinar session. And we want to say thank you so much uh, for tuning in from wherever you are. Please share with us your experiences, say something about you, tell us um, about your experience in um, AI, in data science, or machine learning. And this event uh, themed uh, career pathways in AI. So the event themed career pathways in AI is going to be a highly impactful, information dense and uh, engaging Q&A webinar session with a talent pool of data professionals, both from uh, Kenya and India. We do greatly acknowledge your online presence and look forward to your participation through questions and interactions during the session. And this awesome webinar has been organized by a team of uh, deep learning AI ambassadors, both from Kenya and India, and uh, their efforts and contributions have uh, resulted to the success of this webinar that we have today. So the team on board, we have Tanvi Thankar, we have Kennedy Wangari, Lydia Gadoni, Ramash Sharma, Nicholas Msao, and myself, Grivino Chien. We will be the webcasting team here today. And uh, feel free to throw any questions at us. Uh, let us know if you have any issues uh, concerning the live stream. Any questions, uh, be posting on the Slido link that will be shared and that I'm going to mention shortly. And uh, we want to guarantee you an experiential deep learners webinar of your life. So over the next two and a half hours, we'll be actively engaging in um, this unique and one of its kind uh, Q&A webinar session. We will have our burning questions answered and we will be gaining insights on how to uh, leverage opportunities within existing career tracks in AI and also develop an understanding of organizational uh, job roles in AI. Um, good thing to do right now, grab some coffee or Coke and make yourself comfortable. So, are you ready? Welcome to the deep learning AI community. What do we expect from this webinar today? We will be having a greeting video from Dr. Andrew NG and the Deep Learning AI team in California. Dr. Andrew NG is one of the most impactful educators, innovators, and leaders in artificial intelligence and the technology space in general. He co-founded Coursera and Google Play, launched Deep Learning AI, Learning AI, and was a chief data scientist at Baidu. He has helped to educate and inspire millions of students. And I believe uh, that's part of the reason some of you are here today. We will be having valuable talks from a plenary discussion or webinar uh, session with um, a talent pool of um, local and international industry experts that is from uh, Kenya and India. We will be getting to hear also a keynote address from one of our panelists. And um, at the end of the session, we expect uh, to have explored in-depth insights, um, the right skill mix and technical aptitude for each of the roles in, in AI. And our plenary discussion will also detail the differences between uh, the roles in AI and also how to forge an excellent uh, career path. So um, over the next week, you will receive uh, free coupon codes for deep learning AI courses on Coursera. And do check your follow-up emails with guidelines on how to redeem these coupon codes next week. So um, access will be granted even to the uh, latest uh, NLP specialization that was launched by deep learning AI. So you will have our one month free access to all deep learning AI courses on, on Coursera. So you are also encouraged to effectively utilize your time to emit, learn, connect, and share your experience with this uh, global community of deep learners attending this session. 
how we engage in moving forward. Push your questions to Slido. The link that will be shared on uh, the YouTube live stream chat and the one that you have on your screen right now. So as we gear up for this Q&A webinar session to start shortly, uh, check with the Slido platform and ensure you do respond to the active polls that we have over there. Also, uh, tag and post about this event on, on Twitter or LinkedIn. Hashtags Diplana, Andrew and G, Diplanas Unite, and Deep Learning. Do tag Deep Learning AI and also uh, all of our social media handles that will be shared with you in the chats. At this point, we will get to hear. At this point, we will get to hear the greeting video from Dr. Andrew and G. And um, I'd like to have the video played at this point. Ken. Hello, deep learners. I'm Andrew Ng, founder of DeepLearning.ai, and I'm excited to welcome you to our global deep learning community. I know that many of you are here today because you want to break into AI and build your career. I hope that being part of this community will help you to do so. To give you a proper welcome, I'd like to show you around the DeepLearning.ai offices and meet some of the teams so that you can see where it all happens. Oh, hi, Andrew. Um, do you want to tell our friends at Pine AI what you do at DeepLearning.ai? Sure. Hi, everyone. I, I make articles and other media that help people learn about AI and help them understand the huge impact that AI is having in the world. Today, I'm putting together the next issue of The Batch, our weekly newsletter, and I'm looking for the biggest stories of the week to keep our readers informed. What's been the most surprising thing you've run into working on The Batch? How much is going on in this field? There is never a dull moment. I, you know, you might think from the outside that machine learning engineers really understand everything about AI, but nobody understands everything about AI because this field is just coming to life right before my eyes as I put this thing together every week. All right, I know you're really busy, so I'll let you get back to it. Thanks, see you later. Let's go meet Kian, who helped me create the deep learning specialization. He's working on an exciting new project. So, do you want to tell the people at Pine AI what you're working on? Yes, sure. Um, I'm leading a project called Workera, uh, focusing on helping uh, people get offers uh, in AI and navigating their career by uh, testing their skills, uh, preparing for interviews and certifying them, as well as uh, matching and referring them to good jobs in AI. That's really cool. And what's the most exciting part of your day? You know, the AI field is new, uh, organizations and jobs are still misunderstood. So I'm excited to help people understand what different types of jobs exist in the field, uh, what tasks they will work on and what skills are needed to achieve those tasks. Yep, and that's really important work. Well, it's nice chatting. And now let's go chat to Motel, who is on their product team. Do you want to say hi to our friends at Pine AI and let them know what you're working on? I would love to. Hi, everyone. I lead the product team in DeepLearning.ai, where we create AI education content accessible to people all around the world. People like you. And what are you most excited about right now? I am so excited to see our community grow and to see how eager people are to learn more about AI. Thanks, also. Thanks, Andrew. So as you can see, our team is working hard to support you and help you learn. 
It's never been easier than before to break into AI. So if you want to build a career, you can leverage online resources available, including open source code, data sets, papers, and online courses like a deep learning specialization on Coursera. As part of this journey, I hope you get your hands dirty too. Don't be afraid of diving in to build your own project, or go ahead and try to replicate a research paper that you're excited about. One thing that I've seen help a lot of people succeed is if you can build a community or find a community of fellow deep learners you can meet with and study with on a regular basis. In fact, I hope that this Pine AI meetup that you're at right now will be a good place for you to meet these people. I hope you enjoyed the event today and that you learn a lot both from the talks and from each other. And once again, welcome to the deeplearning.ai community. Great, um, after getting to hear the advice and also uh, the welcoming greeting message from Dr. Andrew and G. Uh, at this particular point, uh, we're going to uh, getting to hear his message towards the uh, earlier mentioned uh, newly launched NLP specialization. We'll also get to understand why is it that uh, Andrew and G is so passionate about the set of courses that uh, is just launched and why he feels this is the best NLP set of courses that will help us to be able to master various cutting edge NLP uh, state of the art techniques and uh, help us to be able to build um, um, uh, NLP uh, systems that are ethical, adoptable, and reproducible. So at this point, let's get to hear uh, his um, message towards the newly launched NLP specialization. And also remember that uh, as you've been informed that um, a few days after the event, you will be able to receive a one month access to this awesome uh, NLP specialization. So get to listen and hear the message. I think that computers being able to understand language has been one of the most amazing advances in AI. NLP has changed a lot over the last several decades. The field has started off using primarily rule-based systems to then using probabilistic systems to now where NLP relies much more on machine learning and deep learning. In this specialization, you learn everything from being able to translate English to French, to understanding if a customer review is a positive review or a negative review, to building a customer service chatbot, to letting a user enter some text and using that to do web search or to do online product search. More recently, with the rise of powerful computers, we can now train end-to-end -end systems that would have been impossible to train a few years ago. We can now capture more complicated patterns and we can use these models in question answering, in chatbots and in other applications. A few years ago, these models would take weeks or even months to train. But with attention, you can train these models in just a few hours. I'm really excited for everyone to get started, to take these courses, learn these technologies and to go build some great NLP systems. Great, uh, we're now getting to the second uh, uh, section of the event uh, and uh, we will be getting to uh, uh, get to know more about our amazing uh, keynote speaker for the day. Uh, and uh, we're so glad and humbled to have him um, in, in for this session and also being part of the panel discussion. Uh, and uh, uh, quickly um, uh, welcome uh, Mr. Timothy Oriedo. Uh, he's uh, the chief data scientist uh, at Predictive Labs uh, based in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, he's uh, amassed a wealth experience of over 15 years in the telecommunication, media and tech industry. Uh, he is an ICF certified uh, organization effective coach. Uh, he's also uh, an MIT certified big data, AI and blockchain expert. So he carries with him uh, competence, expertise, and experience uh, in uh, artificial intelligence, big data, and blockchain. Uh, he's also a PhD candidate in corporate governance and studies. He's been actively involved uh, and passionate towards uh, uh, 
democratizing machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, and data science through uh, predictive lab analytics, and also being actively involved in Kenyan uh, AI meetups, uh, hub data science communities. Uh, he's also uh, been involved uh, uh, to the board and executive of CIO. Uh, and uh, through uh, predictive lab analytics, he's launched um, an amazing uh, set of data science courses uh, that uh, students and uh, working professionals can really leverage on them uh, to be able to dive deep into the data world. Uh, and uh, we're so glad and humbled to have you in today to getting to hear from you to getting to learn more from you uh, and see what more we can build up uh, moving forward. So um, uh, at this point, I would like to humbly welcome you to uh, share with us, get to uh, uh, hear what uh, thoughts, what ideas, what, uh, uh, what you've prepared for us for this particular session. So uh, without much ado, uh, welcome Mr. Timothy to make your keynote presentation. Thank you, and uh, I'm really honored to have been invited to come and give uh, my views around this subject matter that I've been very passionate about. And uh, it's always uh, enlightening to meet different uh, professionals from different fields. And uh, this is a very unique because uh, I see an audience that spans two continents. You've got uh, both Nairobi and India represented. So it will be very keen also to learn what uh, the India side what they're doing and how can we be able to leverage the experiences they've had. Uh, so uh, as mentioned, I'm the founder and CEO of Predictive Analytics Lab. This is a journey that I've worked the last uh, three years since we established in 2017. And it's been a very key learning curve here. Yeah? Just before this, I was uh, presenting as a panelist to a UN Habitat uh, conference. And they were very keen to understand uh, this was a global conference. I've been very keen to understand what are the local solutions uh, we're trying to create to improve slum dwellers and uh, livelihoods uh, of uh, the average uh, citizens. So it actually indicates that uh, these technologies of machine learning, AI, big data are coming of age. Uh, when you find institutions such as the UN Habitat trying to keenly look at what we're trying to do as a early adopters of these technologies, uh, it's uh, exciting to see that we now have an audience that's looking at, at us. And uh, there's a key expectation to see what value addition we're adding to this whole ecosystem. So it's been very lonely at first. I uh, think before two years back, we were doing a lot of uh, conferencing, awareness, basically just evangelizing about big data, uh, going to schools, uh, going to campuses, going to uh, boardrooms, just talking about this. Uh, people didn't understand what this is. This is. Uh, if you try to apply for a job, you are taken to uh, uh, an IT department, uh, which was uh, completely a misfit uh, compared to the skills and the impact that you're supposed to have. Uh, from a career preparation perspective, for universities were not training us. So I had to take a certification from the MIT, which was quite expensive. And uh, because of the experiences that I had there, I decided to set up a local uh, learning lab which uh, actually helps local professionals to be able to gain those skills, yeah, to be able to bridge the gap, the divide we have uh, between the developed countries and uh, our nation. So I'll be, allow me to share a slide and uh, I'll just take about uh, seven minutes and then we'll give pave way to the next uh, session. So my presentation will be titled uh, Pi and AI, the career pathways. And basically this is just to help those ones who are listening in to be able to appreciate what are the various options for them as they start this journey. My background has been in mathematics. So I did an undergraduate degree in mathematics and psychology, but then I went to proceed to work in the media industry, uh, worked in different categories, uh, solved different problems for the corporate sector until a time when I reached the ceiling and decided to um, reinvent myself by uh, learning <clears throat> the data science skill, which I did uh, about five years ago, at very early stages of it, uh, that time still the hype was around digital and uh, digitalization and uh, Google rank. So everyone wanted to either develop websites or learn to do social media analytics. But I looked at my career repository and I thought, why not uh, uh, immerse myself in the deep end 
uh, curate a learning curve that I may be able to address the problems of the future, not the problems of, uh, uh, of today. Yeah, so that's how I ended up setting up this predictive analytics uh, because I realized the vehicle that I was using to drive my agenda uh, through being employed or through the academia was not being met uh, actively. Yeah, uh, so through this uh, predictive analytics, we've been able to evolve. Uh, so far, we're able to uh, take pride of uh, four innovations that we are driving. Yeah, so we are driving those the theme under the theme of technical. So we've been able to develop machine learning softwares, uh, softwares that are used by both public and the private sector, uh, softwares that use very local data and uh, models that we've been able to develop ourselves. So ranging from employee attrition, uh, GIS system uh, tracking, uh, we are talking about uh, 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 image recognition softwares. So using very local solutions and uh, we've been able to provide proof of concept and uh, most of them are increasingly being adapted in the region. Yeah, so we also have a knowledge sharing uh, such as what we're doing now is under the load of knowledge sharing. So I'm very open to be engaged, to come and share my knowledge experiences and skills towards such a summit. So that's why I was uh, happy when this opportunity came. Uh, besides that, we also run very organized training programs targeting different professionals uh, from different levels of maturity yeah, in terms of their career. So we have the master classes, which targets guys who are already working and transitioning, but as I'll be telling you why that needs to happen. We also do strategy and consulting, helping companies adopt to the strategy and emerging landscape. So this is critical because you know, there's what you call the uh, data protection bill that came into law last year here in Kenya. And most companies are required to comply with it. So every company will be required to have a data strategy. Then we also have set up a community. So a community such as this that you're having now need a place where they can always share, exchange ideas, come and learn. So there's a concept we call continuous learning. So those programs, for example, the students have gone through a program in the masterclass, we don't stop engaging with them. So we've created a community where they keep engaging. So under this 4IR, it's a, such an ambitious plan that has got uh, packages such as the job placement, uh, we have consulting opportunities for AI experts. Uh, we've got uh, uh, events uh, that uh, we can uh, match, uh, events you can match your interest to those events. Yeah, and a couple of other uh, services that, and activities that you can engage in as a community. Now, the next uh, thing I wanna talk about is uh, what's driving this career uh, demand, okay? So largely it's recognized that we are in the fourth industrial revolution and the third industrial revolution was driven by the mobile phone. It was driven by digitalization. We may have missed on the second industrial revolution because most of the places they were not connected to the electricity. So uh, we, were, we ended up importing a lot of uh, finished products hence becoming a consumer uh, or a commodity driven society. But in the industrial uh, revolution, the fourth industrial revolution is being defined by technology. So the advent of connected devices, uh, the work of uh, uh, individuals having used mobile phones, there are a lot of digital breadcrumbs that we leave behind. As businesses continue using digital platforms such as ERPs, mobile phone connectivity, uh, social media engagements through uh, which uh, we express ourselves. Uh, we are able now to have a lot of data at our disposal. Improvement in storage capability, we're talking about cloud infrastructure, uh, access to computing power through uh, graphic processing units and uh, virtual machines. It's greatly improved the ability of us to collect and not just to collect and store, but also to process data. So this is where now the evolution is happening. And this is where it's bringing in a spark of demand in these skills. Uh, we are finding a recognition of traditional careers such as mathematics. Uh, you go to the corporate, uh, the, 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 the big technology companies, uh, they've been hiring professors uh, in mathematics, professors in physics, professors in chemistry. And the most, most of the models they used to learn what traditional models, which have now found new meaning because of the improvement in processing ability. Yeah, and uh, just as a proof of that, you can see that one of the oldest mathematical uh, equation, yeah, was able to be solved. Yeah, this is the Higgs boson, yeah, but using uh, big data skills and tools. Uh, in, in a lab in Switzerland, the Sun Lab, which is funded by the IBM and other uh, corporates. So we are talking about a reinvention 
uh, now we're talking about a world of new possibilities because of the evolution of these technologies. And the other part that's driving this and have uh, its regulation. So for example, there, what I'm displaying here is a, a Computer Music and Cybercrime Act 2018, which was signed into law. Uh, we have the Kenya uh, Data Protection Bill, which was signed into law again in November, 2019. And with this, it's creating job opportunities. In this, there's a, a job that's called the Data Protection Officer. And this Data Protection Officer will be required to be certified in the area of data science. So you cannot go and get employed there unless you're certified. So that's a need why you need to learn the skill because it's now creating a new job that never used to exist before. And there are gonna be hundreds of such roles. We're gonna have uh, data inspectors. People are going to walk around inspecting uh, government uh, and uh, corporates and private sector systems. We are seeing lawyers now coming to learn data science because they want to understand now the why and the how of this discipline before they, yeah, they can be able to regulate. Yeah, so there's something we've been saying, do you innovate before you regulate or do you regulate before you innovate? Yeah, so I think education lies at the center of it when you're able to learn these skills, if it's anywhere. So I'm just preparing you to see where you learn. So there'll be a definition of all the different types of data scientists that you'll come across. Yeah, so I'll just mention briefly data business person, some um, a background such as mine, when I, after I'd worked for uh, 12 years in the corporate sector, then went to study uh, data science, but I had a background in statistics and mathematics. So it helped me to apply uh, business problems and solve them using data science skills. Yeah. So you can choose which career path you want. There's a data creative. Yeah. So you'll be looking at data, coming up with the different nuances of how to solve uh, business problems using the data, the data that you see. Uh, these ones will end up as a data journalist. Yeah. Creatively using creative displays. You can end up as an ethnographer. Yeah. There's a data developer again, yeah. So one who sits and designs systems. So these are mostly now data engineers who develop infrastructures and APIs that we expose uh, our Python models with. Then the extreme end, we have the data researcher. So this is someone who's well grounded in statistics, but also can uh, be able to uh, develop some business use cases and also doing some programming and operational research. So this is also another entry point that you can consider depending on where your passion lies. So this is some of the jobs you find, which are emerging, uh, for example, anthropologists. Why is it coming on board as a very strong skill in data science? Because you need to understand behavior and the uh, conflux of behavior and technology is where, that's where the spark of innovation is. Yeah, there's data-driven advertising, there's custom ethnography, people data scientists, the human resource departments now are hiring. Just last week, Safaricom advertised for HR analytics job. And one of the skills that was there is a requirement that you need to have a, at least a use of this open source platform such as R and Python to analyze employee behavior. There's a behavioral economics, there's a special physicist, decision-making psychologist, and data journalist. So these are just key examples uh, from uh, the marketplace. When you're going to look for a data science job, you don't expect it to just be called data science. No, they are actually facets of uh, data science that are embedded in these job roles which are listed here. And what are the key, where do, you, where do data scientists find jobs? So the four leading employers of our data science skill, I mean uh, professionals is IT. So once you have your skill, you can start knocking the doors of uh, Microsoft, Oracle, yeah. Uh, there's education and science, and then there's consulting. So I went into academia, yeah. So I started teaching and then also I started training others through my lab. So education is really key. We are in a stage which we call the winter period where people don't understand what our technology is all about. So a lot of education is gonna be needed. Then there's consulting. Yeah, so again, as you see, most companies, uh, a data scientist will automate himself out of work. So you don't go and work in a place for one year, two years, yeah. You'll go there within six months, you finish what brought you there you've already automated your job. So you look for another challenge. So one of the things that our data scientists are doing is uh, being consultants because it can be able to uh, sustain them across different use cases. You actually get bored when you work in one sector. So cutting across consulting for finance sector, telco industry, uh, consulting for uh, manufacturing, moving across to agriculture, gives you a very rich repository of use cases that you can uh, easily uh, position and anchor your career. Uh, financial services is another key employer. Yeah, banks 
have a huge appetite for data scientists uh, and help in helping reducing risk of their products. So how do these companies get most of the employees? So I was showing you this so that you know exactly how to position yourself. So number one leading way of getting data scientists through competitive hiring. So keep checking job, keep checking job openings. So most companies will be hiring through adverts. There are key adverts which you can reach out to. We've created a platform that does our web scrapping of jobs of data science. And uh, we actually, our lab is in Nairobi and in Johannesburg. So we have representation of our uh, uh, data science placement services in both countries where we place uh, data science talents in specific companies. There's, that's what we call outsourcing, yeah, which is number four. And then there's uh, strategic sponsorships, so hackathons. So we also run uh, uh, innovation labs in a couple of universities that uh, we help to upskill them. So we give them free learning resources and we help them do hackathons with corporates. So we organize hackathons for in, on behalf of companies and uh, to solve particular business challenges. And there's a, this number six is not desirable because uh, most companies don't just wait for the in, inevitable. Yeah. So I think I'll stop there with my presentation and I hope the key insights I've given you are able to just share an idea of where uh, journey, which journey you've already started. I don't know why I'm catching you in that journey, but at least you're able to challenge yourself to grow further. So back to you, the host. Great. Um, thank you so much, Timothy, for um, sharing with us your insights and your journey into AI. And at this particular point, uh, now we will be moving uh, directly to the beforehand questions that were sent by the audience. And I still want to encourage you to be posting your questions right on to Slido, the link that is shared on your chats. So shortly before we move to Slido, there is a poll that we had requested you to respond to. And at this point, I'd love to bring in Ramash Sharma to uh, give us a gist of what the poll responses are. Ramash. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Kevin. Let me just share my screen to display that. Okay, guys, uh, so hello, my name is Ramanj, and uh, please uh, head over to the Slido link that has been posted in the YouTube chat, and uh, please answer this poll for us that what is your knowledge and understanding of machine learning careers before attending this event? This is not only an important feedback, but it will allow us to impact the attendees and participants in a more positive manner in our upcoming events, and even understand how we have impacted them through this uh, live event. So please, uh, um, go ahead to the link and answer this poll. And we will be coming back to Slido shortly to do our Q&A sessions too. So stay tuned for that. Okay, back to you, Griffin. Thank you. Thank you, Ramash. Uh, keep posting, keep tweeting, and keep talking about the event across social media platforms. And right up on stage, I'd, like, I'd love to bring in uh, the first chat moderator for the day, uh, Lydia, who will then usher in the first speaker on deck, Lydia. Thank you so much, Griffin. Welcome everyone, thank, we thank you for joining us today. As mentioned, my name is Lydia and I'll be moderating the first two speakers, Dr. Sandika and Mr. Mwanda Gendi. Today we are pleased to welcome Dr. Sandika Bide on board. Dr. Sandika, she's a senior product manager at AIML at Inoplexus, which is the driver company for AI in pharmaceutical companies. Sanika has done a PhD in health sciences from the University of Pune and a bachelor's and master's degree in nutrition sciences. She is leading the largest life sciences knowledge discovery platform powered by AI for pharma research, drug development and repurposing. She also has 15 plus years of strong and varied techno domain project and product management experience in life sciences healthcare informatics, diagnostic software, as well as biopharma manufacturing. We are excited to have you here today, Dr. Sanika. Welcome. I will take us through a few questions and give you time to share your knowledge with us. Welcome, Dr. Sanika. On to the first you. question. Thank you. Um, AI's potential to transfer. Hello. Sorry. Okay. 
um, AI's potential to, tra to transform the practice of health is immense and life-changing. But you also have current challenges surrounding, surrounding that, including better quality control, transparency, which need to be addressed before we achieve the healthcare revolution, as it is called today. Dr. Sanika, what are your thoughts on AI for health, the potential and the big challenges that you're facing today? Dr. Sanika. Hi, everyone. This is a quick mic check. Uh, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. So thank you so much, Lydia, for that question. I think it's a loaded question, and I would like to answer it in uh, points. So I have tried to put in some of the points that I'm going to talk about on the slide. So all of the audience and participants joining us today can actually also encapsulate this. And uh, these are the key take home messages. So uh, the question was around the challenges in healthcare data and what we can see as the big potential and uh, big potential for AI. So I'll start with uh, saying that healthcare is a very sensitive and very complex domain when it comes to data. So AI for healthcare is both necessary and urgent, but we need to first acknowledge the leading challenges in healthcare. And one of the most important leading challenge in healthcare, which relates to a lot of patient problems, is the systematic bias in healthcare system. Uh, this is across uh, different socioeconomic conditions. This is across countries. This is across within the countries, for example, the medical insurance coverage, poor treatment options, lack of specialized care across different social sections. So this systematic bias in, in healthcare leads to systematically biased data that comes across when we want to aggregate and analyze it. The second challenge is the limited access to the right medical information. So as all of us are in this age when everything that we want is searchable on our mobile phones, there still is a lot of uh, problems in accessing the right kind of information to make appropriate decisions regarding individual healthcare plans. And this is mainly because information is siloed in the medical community. So your information, your disease profile, your healthcare history is all siloed in electronic systems which are locked up in hospitals. Your pathological reports, your reports of your last annual medical checkups, everything is in some big data warehouse where you cannot reach and nobody can analyze this data. So there is limited access, which is a major challenge. There is equally siloed information in the pharmaceutical world. So pharmaceutical companies are competing for a heavily restricted market, for a market that is already oversaturated, although their intention is to always provide the best solutions and medical care to the patients, they are not willing to share their results and their research within the pharma community. And this results in siloed information locked inside big pharmas, which does not allow the uh, research communities to understand about failed treatments. And it takes years together to understand the problems associated with certain medica medications and certain approved medicines. And finally, the issues around data sharing and transparency, because this is personal data. This is data about somebody's health. It's data about somebody's history, his potential issues that he may have in his lifetime. The privacy laws, the patents, and the IP rights are huge. Hello? Hello, you can hear me. Um, I got a text saying the my voice was not audible. Am I am I audible now? Yeah, you can go anywhere. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, sorry. And uh, these are all the challenges. But if we systematically address all these challenges, I truly believe that AI for health will have big impact. And we can have this big impact if we democratize access to patient data. So we are already looking at Medicine 2.0, 
where there will be active participation of individuals in their health care, particularly using Internet and social media platforms. And this is the kind of data that can become the right unbiased data set for AI algorithms to train with. This will be the real world evidential data which will be helpful to model AI algorithms. Secondly, we can tackle the challenges by decentralizing the research data. So open consortiums that can leverage and mine the data to, to identify new insights and novel therapies is a definite big impact for AI in healthcare. And lastly, um, implementing explainable AI because the, the conclusions that an AI model draws based on somebody's health profile uh, cannot be easily validated unless there are all the reports that are provided by the AI algorithm, how it arrived as those specific conclusions. So doctors and patients need to get that confidence as well as regulators and pharma companies need to get that confidence that whatever AI is providing as an output or a readout, we apply the explainable AI component to enrich the confidence score. So those were the challenges and, and the opportunities in AI for healthcare. Thank you, Dr. Sainka, for sharing that with us. And indeed, implementing explainable AI is important to the potential of healthcare data. Um, and our second question, Dr. Sainika, what are your thoughts on the state of AI now and in the future, especially on its impact on enterprise business world? So thank you, Lydia. Um, my thoughts currently around the state of AI definitely would resonate with a lot of the panelists today and most of the audience also, that we are in the age of narrow AI. And we would continue to be in the age of narrow AI where uh, we are creating and training algorithms to generate uh, and design information for very specific data sets or domains. So as a result of this, the systems that we design will not be able to perform outside of that single or couple of tasks that we train them on. So if I have to give you an example from life sciences or healthcare, uh, currently we are in an age where AI is being designed and trained to analyze the genomic data. So all the gene profiling data that has been uh, created or has been uh, found using the next generation sequencing platform. The narrow AI is able to, with very high precision and accuracy, is able to find the mutations or aberrations in this data. But it still cannot handle if I provide instead of the readouts for genomic data, I provide them pathological images. So I think this is where we stand um, around the state of AI. And um, if you can switch the slide, I have a couple of points. Yes. So where can we go from here? So the next step gen definitely is a generalized AI model, which can not just work on what it has been trained to do, but it can identify problem areas. And how can we get there? So I think EQ component, which is emotional quotient, which is coming up as something very, very important than intelligence quotient. If we are able to add this component to our data sets, then we will be able to evolve from a narrow AI to a generalized AI. And we can create training data sets having scenarios where AI is expected to reason, to make judgment calls under uncertainty. So there have been some novel experiments that have gone into making AI imaginative, creative, innovative. So we have seen some beautiful symphonies that AI has composed when it was trained on Beethoven symphonies. And it has also written movie plots uh, when it was trained on data sets from pulp, fi pulp fiction movies. So there are always opportunities to go from narrow AI to generalized AI. And specifically in life sciences, uh, I think this evolution will make a lot of sense. And to your second question, uh, I think where can we see that it will impact the enterprise business world? So I think uh, if we deploy it correctly, AI can free up a lot of time from the leadership and CXO level teams 
currently for operational decisions. So it may be contract management, contract negotiations, handling operational decisions, renewal of contracts, scanning acquisition opportunities, monitoring risks and competitive markets. So narrow AI, if it is trained properly, can definitely handle operational tasks. Thank you so much, Dr. Sanika, for that answer. And into question three, there are probably going to be some corporate departments which will be most impacted by AI. Could be it could be marketing, customer service, etc. In your opinion, which one should should we anticipate more impact on? So uh, I would not say that this ans this question will have a very direct answer. I think it's a application based open ended question. And uh, if we have a mixed audience or heterogeneous audience right now, they would definitely agree that AI is a tool that is extremely domain agnostic and the decision to apply AI approach to any of the departments that you speak about, marketing, customer service, accounting, finance, sales, uh, should be based on very important considerations. So we have to understand that if a department or if a particular domain of a company has to actually um, benefit out of application of AI, then in that particular department, the problem area has to be very, very clearly defined then the approach for solving that problem area should be such that it, the manual interventions are not enough for it. And finally, there has to be a sufficient data set available to create unbiased training sets to create AI models. So if I were to choose, if I were in a company where I knew that marketing department has certain problems which I cannot throw resources at and get solved, I have sufficient historical data to create a model that can answer certain questions. And then I can probably fine tune the AI to get the impact that is expected out of this particular integration through my business ROI. Then I would say that I would choose marketing, for example, as a department. But there is definitely no clear cut answer. In life sciences, I can definitely say that it's simpler because a lot of life science healthcare problem areas are very well articulated. So for me, how to recruit the best patients for a clinical trial in say oncology is one of the very straightforward questions I can create an AI machine learning model for. There is considerable historical data around this topic in open public domain. So I can read out those data, I can collate that data, I can put a lot of neural nets and deep learning on top of that data to be able to draw insights. And I can definitely expect some impact directly related to the healthcare and patients being able to get treated faster. So for me, I think uh, I've tried to answer this question to the best of my knowledge. That is insightful, Dr. Sanika. Thank you for that. Maybe to our last question. Most of our audience are trying to excel and advance in this highly dynamic and evolving field. What actionable plans, strategies, or projects will you share with us while advancing in this field and also building strong and impressive portfolios? So uh, I, I would say that I'm very new to this domain. I cannot have words of wisdom because I am learning myself. And I think deep learning dot AI is also a platform which helps us to keep continuously learning. Uh, what I'd like to share with all the participants today is that uh, each one of us has to find our own journey to discover our path to exploring AI. I explored AI through statistics. Uh, I really had a very strong uh, statistical background in my PhD. I was working on large data sets for biometry and biostatistical analysis. And the love of statistics and the love of mathematics actually led me to getting more and more into the field of application. I then slowly started looking up for bioinformatics. And from bioinformatics, I moved into these new age languages like Python, R, and uh, tried exploring how I can use them to solve my research problems. So for me, the journey began from my PhD where statistics uh, helped me to get into data science. And from data science, I moved into AIML. 
But uh, one thing that all of us have to be cognizant of is that AI is meant to augment our drive to gain knowledge. It is meant to make us more and more thirsty for knowledge. And it's meant to elevate us for higher things. So it's meant to uh, actually free our time for the you know higher cognitive tasks that we want to do. So if your AI is not solving that problem for you, then probably you're looking in the wrong place. So try to identify the areas that you really like, see how they uh, match with AI because AI is a mixed domain. It has so many things in it. It's it's not a pure uh, science field. It is an applied science field. It has a lot of different applications. So you should find your own passion and find your own journey and explore your path to AI. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Sanika. Um, Thank you for sharing with us that informative se informative session and for sharing your, your knowledge and your insights and your experience with us today. Our key takeaway is just to find your passion, find what excites you and follow that. And as, as she said, AI is meant to augment your drive to gain knowledge and elevate you to higher purpose. Thank you so much, Dr. Sanika, for that. Um, I'll now welcome Raman Sharma for any Q&A session from our audience to you, Dr. Sanika. Welcome, Raman. Yes. Uh, thank you, Lydia, for that. Uh, Ms. Sanika, I have a couple of questions from the participants that would be really great if you can uh, share your, some of your thoughts on that. Uh, so our first question from the participants uh, is, how, do, how can they apply artificial intelligence and machine learning to their specific fields, such as medicine or business? So if you can please share some thoughts on that. Absolutely. I think in uh, one of my questions, I tried answering this at a broader level, but um, I'll reiterate myself. So uh, when you start with a problem area or a, a, a problem that you want to solve, now it's specifically in medicine or business, there are a couple of things that you need to uh, do your homework on. So you've identified the problem, but you also need to consider, is AI the right tool to approach that problem. And how would you do that? Uh, you definitely know that AI needs a lot of data to train on. So you need to find out the specific problem in medicine that I'm trying to solve. Say, for example, I want to find uh, a cure for Alzheimer's disease. Now that is a specific medicine problem. And when trying to solve that problem using AI, I need to understand what is the landscape of data that is available for me to train my model to understand the data around Alzheimer's disease? How many different types of data sets do I have to feed my algorithms to be able to make sense of something like this? How multidimensional is the data? And once you have all of this, then you need to make sure that the data is unbiased. So I think understanding what problem area to attack with AI, understanding the data landscape around it, making sure that all of your data is unbiased, and then also creating for your own self a yardstick against which you are going to be saying that what the AI is spitting out is explainable to me. So if the AI comes up with a drug which is being used for, say, your normal cough and cold, uh, a paracetamol, you need to be able to get the readout from AI telling you why exactly has it arrived at the solution. Because an AI solution in a black box actually doesn't solve anything. So that's my short answer. Yes. Okay, thank you so much for that. That was very nice. Uh, I have another question from the participants for you. Uh, is that I've, I've just heard you uh, mention that even you are somewhat relatively new in this field. So coming from you as a professional, what advice do you give to students and beginners as to how they can find and interact with online AI communities that can help them get started in machine learning? So uh, for me, uh, because this was pre-COVID, I was very fortunate to be part of very few, uh, very um, small, close-knit local communities uh, which operate out of Pune. For example, Women in Data Science, uh, and uh, all of you would agree that face-to-face -face interactions al almost always uh, have a better vibe to it. But nevertheless, uh, I have been using very, very, uh, you know, 
common uh, Eventbrite and um, a meetup groups to keep a track of what is happening locally around me and uh, trying to align it with what I do at my workplace. So I not just find out online AI communities, but I also see that the intersection of these AI communities falls at least close to the domain that I'm working in because if I start attending AI communities uh, which are working on problems in physics or, or maybe environmental sciences or paleobiology or uh, space uh, research, I would draw insights from it, but I would not get application examples which I can go back to my work and try to solve or try to apply or try to create something out of it. So there are two things that I look for, whether it's a local community, because when it's uh, local, also it's more reachable. But even on the global scale, when I'm looking for online AI communities, I see the overlap with my areas of interest. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Sanika. That was really informative for the participants. I would take this moment to also remind the participants to also keep uh, polling on our live polls. It is very helpful for us. So with that being said, uh, thank you so much. Now back to you, Griven. Thank you so much, Ramansh, for that session. And thank you so much, Dr. Sanika, for sharing with us your insights and your knowledge in this, this day. I'll take this moment to gladly welcome Mr. Mwenda Mugendi to our session today. Mr. Mwenda is a data scientist with Microsoft Research in a team called FarmBits, which is a Microsoft agricultural platform that empowers farmers around the world with innovative solutions in AI. Mr. Mwenda has an MS in Data Science from John Hopkins University, an MS in Computational Intelligence from the University of Nairobi, a BSc in Computer Information Systems from Kenya Methodist University. He is constantly looking for to better the lives of farmers by using advanced analytics, implementing big data analytical tools, creating and maintaining models, and onboarding compelling new data sets. He set up the first Africa's AI research lab with concentration in solving Africa's toughest problems, specifically in agriculture, healthcare, energy, and financial inclusivity. Welcome so much, Mr. Mwenda. We're glad to have you here with us today. Thank you. Okay, um, on to our first question to you today. Having interacted and been in the agricultural sector in AI, what are the mentorship, collaboration, and career opportunities in the same? And how can we tap, capitalize, and monetize the opportunities available? All right. Uh, thank you so much, Lydia, for, for this opportunity uh, to talk to people about, about my journey and career pathways uh, in here. So on to the first question. Um, so this is guy, uh, it's called uh, Dr. Akiwumi Adesina. He's the head of uh, Africa Development Bank, eh, the president. He once said that agriculture, I think it's in January this year, he once said that agriculture is the most important business in the world. The size the size of food and agriculture in Africa expecting to increase by up to by a uh, trillion dollars by 2030. So what I think is AI shifting the way how food is produced. Most of the work involved in agriculture is increasing the efficiency of, uh, of agricultural production. Um, and I think the three main places where this happens is monitoring uh, crop health. Uh, this is done by mostly leveraging computer vision and deep learning algorithms to process the data captured uh, from satellite imagery, drones, smartphones, you can see. And the second area would be, um, uh, we are seeing a huge uptake uh, of ML enabled machines, especially tractors. For example, tractors that can automatically weed your farms, can harvest crops, uh, can, can plant your crops without any human input at all. And the final part where we see a huge impact of AI in agriculture is in crop uh, yield prediction. So, and one of the things actually we did around this area was in India, where we did, where we built an, uh, a system uh, that is based on a feature phone network that is used to help farmers understand when's the right time to to actually to actually grow their crops and all that. And we are able to actually help them increase their 
the, uh, the yields by 30%. Now, in view of all these things, I think some of the best places, some of the, uh, the best areas in agriculture for your career opportunities would be from a computer vision perspective, especially when you're dealing with satellite data imagery, when you're dealing with, um, with uh, drone imagery, smartphone imagery, and all that, uh, to as scientists, uh, data scientists. So you're looking, at, you're looking at a lot of, you're actually seeing a lot of potential and a lot of opportunities around uh, data scientists. As these are primarily people who actually use uh, uh, data science skill set to manipulate satellite images and all that. And then the final bit where I see a lot of opportunities arise from an agricultural point of view would be around the robotic uh, engineers, especially these, these, are, these are the engineers who are responsible for building automated uh, machines that are able to go to the harvesting, planting, and growing of crops, it is, it is without any human inputs. And actually, what we have one Kenyan team that, uh, that represented us in the, in the Imagine Cups, uh, in the Microsoft Imagine Cups uh, competition, and they're called, they're called the Team Knights. The nights and they compose of uh, Kenneth Eshira and Michael Moisakeni, I think. And they actually created a weeding robot that farmers are able to use without the, the farmer's input. So that shows you that there's actually a lot of potential and actually people are taking advantage of these things too, to, to help empower the agricultural uh, industry. Um, the thing about monetizing these solutions from my, from my own personal view, I think it's about ensuring that number one, you're building a critical mass problem, uh, you're solving a critical mass problem. Number two, it has a high pain point for, for the farmers. And number three, it's affordable for these farmers. You have to be, you know, one of the things that characterize the, Africa, the African continent, especially from an agricultural point of view, and also East Asia, is the fact that a lot of farmers are small scale family holder farms with, uh, with around three, uh, 2.1, an average of 2.1 hectares of land. And for you to be able to build solutions for them, you have to make sure that the solutions are actually meet the biggest pain points and they're able to afford. Yeah, that's what I think about, about this question. Interesting. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mwenda, for sharing with us that. Um, on to our next question. What are your thoughts on the state of AI now and in the future, especially on its impact on enterprise business world? All right, thank you for that. Um, so I think AI is changing the world uh, forever, and it's likely to be more profound than most people and organizations actually realize today. And we see there's a lot in Africa and Kenya being part of part of Africa, of course. So we are seeing AI machines that are able to to see. So for example, through computer vision, we are seeing AI machines, uh, AI tools, AI systems that are able to actually hear through speech recognition systems, talk through speech uh, generation walk through robots and even drive through self-driving cars, right? So this means that uh, businesses are actually able to develop completely new ways of interacting with their customers, which is very important. Which is very important for you to be able to understand your customers, build solutions, tools, services that actually solve their critical needs and they're able to also automate the processes and boost their overall business, business success. So the biggest mistake I think anyone can do in this market at this particular time, uh, at that point in time, is ignore no AI or even think that they actually understand everything about it. And what a lot of people, uh, researchers and uh, world leaders, AI leaders are talking about is, I think for me, one of the things that actually hits home is when I hear uh, Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, talking about how he thinks AI is the future, and not only for Russia, but also for the entire humankind. That just shows you just how big and, and, and impactful AI is and it's gonna be moving forward. So having said that, there are a lot of developments, I think, uh, in the AI space. And uh, for, for the last few years, actually the last two, three years, we've seen a lot of development in the NLP space, the, the language, uh, the natural language process, uh, process space, yeah? With especially the BART and the GPT series of algorithms that are able to take in uh, data, uh, data from people and actually able to create new conversations, new ways of translations, etc. etc. And in the computer vision space, we've also seen a lot of work, especially with the object detection and instant segmentation, especially when you look at uh, models and frameworks like mask, uh, the current, uh, mask uh, RCNNs, units, YOLO models, and, and what have you. 
So what I think is that AI is taking a central role, uh, role sorry, in our lives. Uh, from a business perspective, I think we can, it would help us actually change the way we understand and interact with our customers. And an excellent example of this would be companies like Facebook and Google. Yeah? They are able to actually use our data to help us to improve the process in which we interact with the systems. We purchase goods and services and also connect with other people in the communities. Another way I think AI is able to impact our businesses is, from, uh, is by offering uh, intelligent products and services. So we're talking about things like Spotify, for example, that are able to customize themselves to your liking, uh, Netflix, YouTube, etc. The third way I think that AI is going to change the enterprise world um, is through improving and automating the business, the business processes. So one thing uh, that has happened uh, recently is the, the COVID situation. So we have a lot of businesses and, 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 and businesses the world over, and especially in Africa, and I talk a lot from the context of Africa and Kenya because it's where I'm mostly based, right? Uh, and, and I've seen a lot of businesses that are actually realizing the potential of technology and AI, especially after this COVID, uh, COVID situation. And they're realizing, they're, they're realizing that for us to be able to survive and, and thrive in this new era, the post-COVID era, we need to be able to embrace technology more, we need to be able to embrace data science, machine learning, AI more to be able to actually help us make competitive in this new, 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 new technological era. I personally know of startups that actually thought technological startups, uh, technology startups, AI startups that actually thought they were going to be, they're going to be, the way they were going to go under as a result of the COVID situation. But what they're actually seeing is an increase in business. At, crazy, crazy, a sudden boom in their business operations. And they're telling me, you know what, we don't understand why this is the case, right? And it's because for them, they're very invested in the technology space, in the AI space, in understanding their customers through their data and building solutions that are actually able to, to solve them. Now, moving forward, yeah, I think, and, and, and again, I speak this from, uh, from, uh, from Kenyan context and an African context, I see, I especially see a huge uptake of uh, specific AI, 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 AI frameworks, and I think one of them would be the psychology AI. So this is basically where you get to build AI solutions that understand people's behaviors based on the psychology, based on the human mind, and use that to actually uh, improve the business processes and build better products for and services for your customers. So that's one area I see uh, AI moving forward in the, in the, in the, in the foreseeable, uh, foreseeable future, in this case, two to three years. Uh, so sorry, two to, two, I think, five years. Another place I see a huge uptake of AI moving forward is uh, the AI-driven edge computing. So we're talking about sensor AI using sensors and data from sensors and mobile phones to drive AI. Also, I'm looking at computer vision as another big driver of AI in Africa and uh, NLP. And, and, and the reason for this is because this, this, this tools, this framework enable a deeper understanding of people and the environment, which in turn helps business build products and services that actually empower, empower users. I personally feel, and this is now my personal opinion, so take it with a grain of salt. I, I personally feel that AI, where you're taking some structured data in a CSV file or from an SQL data, uh, database and fitting ML and query things is a solved problem. And a lot of companies out there actually uh, increasingly innovating uh, around this space to fully automate this process. So right now, there are tools that I enable you to actually do this uh, without writing any single line of code. So for example, Microsoft Azure ML Studio. And I think it's important as, 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 uh, as practitioners of, of AI, of machine learning, to think about how we can move forward from just uh, building tools and models for structured data, but into other methods of building tools and models for structured data. In this case, NLP, computer vision, satellite imagery, etc. Uh, etc. So for an in depth, there's a website I like that talks a lot about the state of AI, and it's uh, it's called uh, w, it's the, the URL is www.stateof.ai, and it talks a lot about where AI has been and where we think uh, where where people feel that AI should is gonna be in the next couple of years, and I think it's important for all of us, if possible, to actually go to the website and see how AI looks in the next future, in the next uh, few years for all of us. Thank you so much, Mr. Mwenda. That was insightful and very informative. Um, now that now that you've been in the space of AI for a while now, doing your projects and working, could you share with us um, one concrete example of applying AI project to an enterprise, how it worked, and basing on your professional work, how it worked, Mr. Mwenda? All right, thank you. 
Okay, no worries. Thank you. So I, I've worked in this space for 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 the last six years now, uh, give or take uh, six uh, years now. I uh, started off as a data analyst in a consulting firm uh, called Leanne, and then moved on as a to, to become a data scientist and. Uh, ended up being an head of uh, AI, uh, did data science for it, uh, before actually moving to, to another startup where we, are, we were creating, where we were building the first research lab in Africa at that time. Now for that, we did some, some work in, a, in, a, in a, with the UN. I worked for the UN as an applied machine learning scientist and also for, for Microsoft. So one of the things that I have is basically, so what I'm trying to say is we have a I've juggled quite a lot of projects, but I think I'm gonna pick one that I've done recently. And it's around uh, being able to empower farmers to actually grow more food in their farms and 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 and, and, and being able to relay to relay this information to financial institutions so that they're able to be helped to get to get a better uh, to get loans and, and insurance uh, in a cost-effective way and an easy and, and fast way. So what we're trying to do, what I was trying to do is basically Based on uh, based on data from from mobile phones, from uh, audio data, we're trying to see if it's possible to actually build an ML system that is able to take all these different data streams, uh, build models that are able to analyze all these data, uh, different data streams, and uh, use those results to actually tell the banks or the insurance companies which farmers you should you should uh, should lend money to, which farmers should help uh, upskill their their learning process and, and 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 all that. So one of the biggest challenges, number one, is uh, being able to build a, a, an ML model that is able to take multiple data streams. In this case, we're talking about sound data and, uh, and image data. So in this case, we had to apply a lot of a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of knowledge. So we're talking about uh, digital signal processing, how to analyze sound data, get information from from the sound data, how to clean up the noises in the sound data, all the way to uh, being able to apply cutting uh, cutting edge ML uh, computer vision models. So in this case, for example, YOLO and uh, Matsar Semen, able to actually detect what's happening, what's happening on a farm at any given point in time, uh, any given point in time. And the final thing that was actually very, the other thing that was actually very difficult is bringing these results together, right? So you have predictions from uh, the sound model, for example, from the image model. How do you put these results together in a way that people are able to understand? So that way, we did not have any way, there was no way that existed that would be able to actually do this. So one of the things that we actually did was we had to create our own in-house way to actually match these different data streams and come up with one, come up with one result. So one of the things I'm trying to share, to show here is the complexity in actually solving, solving some of these problems. They take a lot of knowledge from different disciplines. It requires you as an AI practitioner take a lot of uh, knowledge and insights from different uh, learning uh, paradigms and bring them together to create actually create a solution that is able, that is able to impact to impact people positively so once you've done that move on to the next process how do you actually uh, serve this uh, solution to multiple five, to millions of farmers out there to to financial institutions out there and then we start looking at how how to design a data intensive application that takes in thousands thousands of requests hundreds of Thousands of, uh, thousands of requests at any given point in time. So you look at the, how do you use cloud computing to be able to actually to actually serve this uh, this uh, this information, these insights in a in a way that, that, that in a way that does not create bottlenecks. You're looking at how to create services, microservices, such that in case one service uh, fails. So, for example, in case the sound the sound service or the image service fails, it does not affect the other part of the system. You're also looking at how you're going to serve these uh, these results to the farmers. A lot of the farmers use uh, feature phones. So, how do you actually take all these uh, these complex ML that has been trained on uh, gigabytes of data sets, terabytes of uh, data sets with huge computing capability into the hands of a farmer who only have a feature support, right? So you have to develop APIs and, and to be able to actually serve, to actually serve these results to this farmer in an easy and uh, in an easy and understandable way uh, to, to them. And also again, you think about, uh, when you think about the solution, you're also thinking about how do you actually empower the financial institutions, right? So how do you build a solutions for, uh, that, uh, that the banks can actually integrate with this system to be able to get accurate results and, and, and answers. So you're looking at building dashboards, building APIs that connect the dashboards to, to, to the ML system to be able to serve this solution to, to the financial institutions and the insurance companies. So when you look at 
the ML ecosystem, especially the ML in production ecosystem, it goes way beyond just training a uh, fitting a model, an ML model into, into your data. You have to think, you have to be cognizant of the fact that there are other things at play, there are, there are latency issues at play, there are throughput issues at play, there's the connectivity, data con internet connectivity from farmers uh, at play and all that. And it becomes a very complex, a very complex, uh, a very complex problem. So moving forward, especially my advice to people uh, who are getting to this space, the deep learning ML space, are those who are already there. Um, one, it's good to actually think about uh, just building the models and, uh, and and building good models, accurate models, and all that. It's also, it's also, I think it's so very important to actually think about how you get to serve these models, right? So you're thinking about the data engineering part, you're thinking about the DevOps part, you're thinking about the, the, the user interface part, and all and, and how all these uh, spaces actually combine to create one good holistic solution for people to use. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Not just think about building the models, but also how to serve the models. Thank you for that. Um, maybe to our last question, uh, there have been issues about privacy in when it comes to ML in production, and it can be scary to put models in data out there. Are there any tools specifically made for privacy in ML? And also, what do we need to know about privacy? All right. Thank you. Thank you for this. Yeah. Uh, so, so I take a slightly different approach in the in this privacy discussion. And, and just to be the devil's advocate here, I am. You know. You know. You know. The thing is, innovation. High speed innovation is. It's a very imperfect process, right? So it's about trial and error, uh, looking at things, uh, trying different things, seeing what works, what doesn't work, and learning from that process. So. Firstly, what I think is the reason as to why AI has grown drastically over the last eight years, especially with deep learning, is because of the availability of data, right? And the reason it's uh, deep learning uh, models are so good is because they've been fed data that based on who you ask, if you ask uh, based on the certain uh, the quotas that you ask, would say that actually infringe on the privacy of users. And companies have become super powerful as a result of this, right? So, so let's, let's for, especially for the, for, the, for the local market, the Kenyan market, when you look at the, the many, many uh, mobile, mobile lending applications out there, right? If you, if you ask someone from the US or from the UK, if these apps actually infringe on your, on, the, on, 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 your, on your privacy, it would be a hell yes, I think so too. I think they do infringe on the privacy of, of, of users out there. But then again, if you ask yourself, if these data, the data that they use actually has helped them to sort of, sort of um, uh, build on the innovation and become very innovative uh, companies around the financial the financial space. The answer will be yes, and actually we are used a lot as a case study, right? Before before WhatsApp launched their the financial platform using uh, their, their financial module for sending money and all that, we actually had. Um, Mark Zuckerberg coming to Kenya and actually trying learning and trying to understand how MPESA works and how we can actually uh, uh, integrate, build something similar or, or integrate it into the into the WhatsApp uh, platform. So, so from a privacy perspective, I think um, it's it's a it's, it's a great area, right? That 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 uh, I don't I don't I don't really mean that they, they should give companies the power to actually take people's data out there and just use it as 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 as, as they think deems it, as deems fit for them. So and that is why laws like the data privacy laws and then and, and the are the laws that we see from the UK and the US are very important because in this case, what they do is they are able to actually contain companies and tell these companies, you know what, well, yeah, we know that the process of innovation requires access to this data, but we have to be able to uh, guide or we have to be able to regulate how you get to use people's data. And, and what I'm trying to say is it's not denying the fact that data is critical to the success of AI. And that is what we need to, and, and I think for us, we need to be able to look at these laws and, and, and see how we can actually innovate around these laws. So I think these laws are very important. So in the, uh, having said that, I think there's some things that we can actually do to ensure that users, that we put users at the center of this AI system. So as much as we're using data to design these AI systems, I think there are ways we can actually use, we can, can actually uh, 
uh, use their data to ensure that we are able to protect them. So one of the things I do think is important is making sure that we do what we call a complete anonymization of data before, before usage. So every time a company gets new data from whichever source we get it from, making sure that we strip any personal identifiable information from that data and just use the descriptions of the metadata to actually build their ML, their ML models. <clears throat> another thing, and, and I think this is a very important thing, and actually I've worked on it, is, uh, is having a data marketplace where data producers and data consumers so consumers are connected, right? And data producers are compensated for the usage of their data, and they have control of who has access to the data and how they get to use it. And actually, I, I have been involved a lot in, in, in building such a, uh, such a project within Microsoft. Uh, my role was actually designing that, architecting the, designing and architecting a system, a data marketplace, where we are able to connect data producers and data consumers. So what we're trying to solve with this solution, uh, with this uh, system was we give people access to how much data, how much data of theirs is out there. So they get to know how much data of theirs is out there and they get to actually control who gets to uh, who gets access to that data and how they get to make money from that data. So we know a lot of companies out there, the top, some of the top companies in the world right now get actually to use the data that you provide to them, you provide to them to do a lot of so they to build uh, additional solutions and capability capabilities into their system. So what we're trying to do with this system was, you know what, we were giving you the user the power to say, you know what, I control who gets access to my data. And if you get to use my data, you actually get to pay me to, to, for, to, for, usage, for, uh, for usage of my, of my data. And finally, a uh, last point on this is, I personally think this is where edge computing, sorry, <clears throat> Edge computing is actually becoming a winner, right? Because edge computing allows you to actually build models and run those models from people's devices. So you're talking about running uh, ML models on your mobile phone uh, on, on some sensors out there, without your data having to leave to leave your your to leave to leave to leave your device. So I think it's a very important thing because in this case you get to have full access of your data and not another company. So your data gets to be stored on the device, and the only thing another company gets to contribute is is um, is, is the ML models that get to analyze your data and give insights on your data. So I think edge computing is going to define AI in a huge way, and I think for people who are looking at ways uh, places whereby they want to make a huge impact in, in AI, I, I'm, I would personally think that you should look into the way of edge computing because there's a, there's a lot of opportunity out there in that space. Yeah. Um, thank you so much Mr. Mama, for sharing with us and thank you. really appreciate your time and your knowledge and your insights that you shared with us today. Uh, I'll just take this time to welcome Ramansh. I'm sure there's some questions from our audience. Ramansh, welcome and share with us the questions to Mr. Amanda. Thank you. Yes, <clears throat> thank you so much, Lydia. And thank you, Mr. Munda, for that wonderful session. It has been very informative. Uh, as of now, like I would like to uh, remind the participants um, that uh, you know we only have uh, six polls as of now. So make sure that uh, you go ahead and um, answer the live poll right now. We will soon be closing it and starting our next poll. Uh, we mostly have on a scale of one to 10 or four right now of the general understanding of the attendees on machine learning careers. We hope that it will significantly move up by the end of this session as we move forward with our other panelists and speakers. So with that being said, I would like to just hand it back uh, to you guys to continue and make sure guys to continue voting on the poll. Thank you so much. Good. Uh, for this particular time, uh, we're going to have our next uh, uh, speaker and who also happens to be our keynote speaker. Uh, that is uh, Mr. Timothy Oriedo to getting to hear uh, uh, some of the beforehand questions that uh, uh, we've been able to consolidate from our attendees and get to hear and learn more from you. Great, uh, Mr. Timothy, um, you've been actively involved and also uh, uh, in training um, uh, various uh, scholars through predictive lab analytics. 
uh, and also all the amazing work that uh, you've been doing in democratizing data science and machine learning knowledge. So uh, with that vast experience uh, and the knowledge that uh, you've been able to gain all along, uh, you get to realize that most of the courses out there don't really get to touch in depth on model deployment and handling uh, post deployment issues and the various pain points in machine learning in production. So uh, briefly, you could share with us uh, or recommend to the attendees any resources, any books, any materials uh, that we can be able to learn more on matters to do with model deployment, uh, machine learning operations, product management and validation. Mr. Timothy. Hello, Mr. Timothy. Uh, are you, are you, can you hear me on the call? That seems, uh, Mr. Timothy, are you there? Uh, seems from Hello? You're getting. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, yes, Mr. Timothy, welcome back, welcome back. Huh? Yes. Uh, great. Um, so, um, uh, uh, did you get to hear my question, or uh, should I refresh it again? Just come again. Yes. Uh, great. Uh, so, uh, just come again. Quite sure, quite sure. Uh, uh, with your vast experience of uh, over fifteen years and being actively involved uh, in democratizing and also providing training uh, courses in data science and machine learning through predictive lab analytics. Uh, you've got to realize that uh, most of the courses that are out there uh, and the programs that are out there don't really get to touch or go deep or in matters to do with model deployment and how to address the various uh, machine learning in production and post deployment issues. So uh, maybe with uh, your experience uh, in both as a trainer and instructor and in the field, are there any resources or materials that you could recommend attendees to be able to learn more on model deployment, uh, ML operations uh, and other key topics? Yeah, yeah, of course now before you even rush to go and do the ML deployment, I think what will be important will be able to uh, appreciate how do you start even uh, cleaning the data, yeah? How do you start visualizing it? How do you uh, appreciate the different uh, feature engineering uh, approaches to be able to uh, deploy the right model? And I think that's where we spend more time trying to sharpen the skills of our, uh, most of the participants who come through our programs. Uh, so in that regard, um, and because we, uh, our platform is mostly um, endeared towards targeting uh, mid tech to uh, not high tech. Uh, so we will have less of software engineers coming to a program. We have a more of a uh, business BI uh, intelligence analyst. We have more, uh, we have more of the business leaders. Yeah. So someone with a competency, for example, in a, a vendor solution understands the business problems. So we show them about how to do reverse engineering to be able to solve the problems using open source uh, approach. And I think, uh, when, when you look at that now, it shows you uh, a need to uh, focus more on the feature engineering part. Yeah, so after you've learned about how to deploy your, no, sorry, after you've learned about how to uh, solve the business problem using a model, now the ML deployment be becomes uh, something that uh, can be done uh, using even enterprise solutions. Yeah, so for example, you can use uh, uh, different uh, platforms such as Azure. Uh, to deploy it uh, or just very easily clicking tabs, drag and drop. Uh, we have our, our favorite uh, module that we like, uh, we, we, we like encouraging people to learn is a building of APIs You're using Django and Flask, uh, which we find to be um, uh, quite steep in the learning journey, but very versatile in application because it prepares you for either side. Yeah. So we don't take any shortcuts in uh, uh, teaching those skills. Yeah, so we give you an option. So once you 
we do a three-stage approach. So once you've learned the nitty gritties of uh, data cleaning, data analysis, and data visualization, and a bit of ML uh, in feature engineering, they move to the next step. How do you develop more understanding of deep learning algorithms? Uh, so uh, platforms are using platforms uh, for feature engineering in uh, uh, image recognition, uh, uh, voice analytics, uh, video analytics in deep learning and uh, natural language processing. Uh, then uh, the next bit after that now is on the level three is now when we teach you about deployment. So having gone through all those phases. Yeah, so it's a robust uh, program. And I think one of the things we encourage is assessments. So we do have assessments uh, both at uh, beginner level, intermediate and advanced. And these assessments carry different formats. So for example, we do project-based assessments where we use real projects. Uh, we are actually Kaggle partners yeah, in the, in the region. So we uh, uh, enable participation in the Kaggle uh, competitions where we also are able to benchmark the skills of participants against the others globally. We have developed our own hackathon. So we have a leaderboard uh, where every month we share a task and there's a reward to that task. Most actually, these problems come from the real business world. Some of these problems were given by clients. Yeah. And uh, we, instead of going to, 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 to just solve it straight away, we use a, a, it as a learning approach and there's a reward to it at the end of a, uh, the achievement of the task. Yeah. So you're able to see an all rounded individual who's just not uh, using the skills in a very academic way, but you're only using the skills to solve real problems. One of the conditions for you to enroll for a program is you have to come with a real problem from work. So you might find a mix of participants who are sponsored by the companies. So there's an agenda that I'm going to enroll for this course and the end of this course is what I want to, to achieve. So it becomes a key measure in terms of KPIs of what uh, they should have achieved at the end of the course. We have those ones who are not, who are coming from our consulting background. We actually encourage them to speak to one of the clients to tell them what they're wishing to solve and are they, you know, the uptake has been quite uh, good because I think at the end of it, someone walks out with something tangible. It's almost a, an immediate ROI because when you enroll for a program and maybe you are coming with a challenge from, face, say, uh, a company that seeks to uh, uh, develop optimization for its uh, distributor, uh, root distribution for beer. Yeah, so all through, you come with the data, we walk through the emotions, build models using uh, ML uh, and feature engineering, and then we come and deploy the models so you can be able to see the end results in a very easily explainable way. And I think for that has been a good success and we hope to uh, to grow a lot more of that. So we use a blended approach. Uh, there's a skill gap. Uh, we need trainers who can be able to train in some certain niche facets. Yeah. And that's where we utilize platforms uh, such as uh, Coursera to be able to curate content. Yeah. So uh, you'll sit with your coach and then he'll tell you now because of uh, this skill and this skill and this skill, this is the course that you need to go and do. Yeah. So because we are still developing local talent. Yeah. So we also work with the, uh, the mock platforms so that uh, we're able to get the best in terms of knowledge transfer. Yeah. That's great. Um, that's great. Uh, uh, informative. Uh, so probably briefly in less than 20 seconds, you can share, you could share with us some of those resources, some of those uh, open source materials that you mentioned that uh, you do uh, leverage on for the classes that you could recommend the attendees to also maybe uh -huh. go out there and look out and they can okay. be able to get to learn more. Yeah. Okay, so we've put the materials in a platform. Um, or do I type it in the chat? Oh, sure, oh, sure, you can, you can, you can type it. So it's, uh, where is it? So you'll go to 4IR. So 4IR is the fourth industrial revolution dot uh, predictive analytics dot co dot ke. Uh, just uh, copy paste it from my browser and paste it there. So what I'll do is, uh, I need to give you a coupon to access because uh, uh, we we use it exclusively for our students and uh, certain communities where we go to uh, where, where we engage in such a kind of conversations where we give talks. 
uh, to the general public, it's a paid for platform uh, because we spend resources to generate the content that's there. So for it to sustain itself, also we need to uh, monetize it. So just go and check it out and then uh, you, you, you'll contact me with your team. I'll give you a coupon that uh, we can agree on a certain number of guys who attended this session to be able to access the system in about 15 to 20 or 30 days, yeah? Great, great. Well, make sure you send me an email, then we are able to agree. But for now, you can be able to explore just the overview of it, but you'll not be able to access the material till you log in. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll move to the next question. Uh, we've had talks and uh, a lot of Is concern. Uh, for me? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Still for okay. you. All right. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, uh, we've had talks and conversations around uh, interpretable machine learning, as also our last speaker also talked about building explainable AI solutions. Uh, and um, would like to hear from you because you get to realize that at times you have a question like, I'm so concerned about the direction my project is going. When is the rightful time to talk about ethics? Is it too late? So would you probably share with us uh, a few techniques and approaches that uh, you'd recommend that uh, the data professionals to implement as they build their solutions to be adoptable and also ethical? Okay. So, so I, I'm, I'm coming from a business background and I'd like to talk uh, in regard to that where uh, businesses are always in a cutthroat competition to achieve some comp sort of competitive edge. Yeah? And uh, in that regard, ethics always plays second fiddle. Uh, what you'll experience is a scenario where most companies are striving to innovate uh, without regulating or you'll find companies not asking for permission, but asking for they're not asking for permission, but asking for forgiveness. So in, you remember the case of uh, uh, the case of uh, Cambridge Analytica, yeah. So it's purely an innovation without ethics, yeah. So there's nothing wrong that to their uh, there's nothing wrong they did to to the extent that till when they were discovered what they done that when it became wrong, yeah. So when we're talking about ethics, I think it's important to uh, bear and put in mind. Uh, what, what, what the awareness levels of our consumers is increasing, yeah? So those surveillance and the data processing and the value addition that we've been doing to data, which we uh, call infa that infa data, uh, it's, it's, it needs really need to be governed. Uh, we, we're also talking about experiments uh, being done at large scale because of availability of open source technology. You now you see because of free education, people can go and subscribe for a free course online. And someone has got a lot of time in their disposal. So if someone has got, this is distributed knowledge, you know, you cannot dictate where knowledge is. Locally, if you are writing a thesis for your master's or your PhD, you have to write a letter to Nakosti, yeah, for Nakosti to approve your PhD or research thesis. But in this, so one of the things they check is the ethics. Yeah, what is go, is your research going to have some ethical implication? But now we are living in a new world where there are no such checks and balances, yeah? So someone can create something, post it online, and there you go. So right now, as you speak, you've seen that AI algorithm that uh, is able to change Obama's uh, face to be to be white. And uh, those are the kind of things you see when uh, these technologies are thrown out, are there to be used by, by all and sundry. Yeah, so to, to, to be able to answer you, I think we have a lot of uh, work to do here. Uh, unfortunately, the pace with which technology is accelerating we have no control. That's why you have platforms such as Bitcoin, yeah, which again came just the, uh, the, the base of uh, 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 cryptocurrencies is uh, data science because it's all about inscription, yeah, and compression of algorithms. Yeah, so some of those technologies, when they run in the long hands, now you see such kind of uh, products coming up in the market, and uh, we have not, we are, we are yet to see uh, the worst. Yeah, uh, we are talking about even corporate companies being affected. Uh, you know, the Max 737 having a bug in its software uh, just because they didn't follow the due processes in the engineering process of the, developing that software because they outsourced for engineers. Uh, so a lot of these bloodlines in terms of how do we apply these technologies, how do we govern ourselves? Yeah, so we have a lot of work to do there. And uh, if you just watch the space in a few months, unfortunately, now the government is... Uh, 
I always look at it in uh, this regard. So for example, in my experience, I've worked in the corporate sector, I've worked in the uh, private, I've also worked in academia, I've consulted for the public sector. So the public sector is always about the past. So they'll wait for something to happen, then come and regulate. Yeah, the private sector is always about today. What results are you putting on the table? It's about profitability. Uh, 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 what value addition have you shown? And academia, we're always concerned about tomorrow. So you come up with cutting edge solutions. A lot of the models that we study now that have come to life, for example, the gate recognition are models which were developed in the 80s. And uh, if you read the abstracts and the, uh, the seminal papers which gave birth to those technologies, actually the, uh, the, owners, the, the owners who wrote those papers even died. But now this is when these aspects like gate recognition, gate now is being recognized as a, a biometric. But the research paper that gave uh, that, uh, actually it was first done by Alan Turing in the 1950s. Yeah, he was, not a med he, was not, he was not a biomedical guy, but he wrote a paper about the same thing. Yeah, so because of the advent of the technology, all things are coming back to be, uh, to kick back. And uh, it's going to be a very fuzzy engagement, uh, finding academia, working with government and also private sector to ensure that these ethical issues are able to be properly addressed. Well, great, great. Uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing your knowledge and also uh, different views and uh, on that particular question. So we'll get the last uh, question uh, for now uh, before we get to see what questions or what feedback we're getting from our attendees. So uh, one last more question beforehand for you. Uh, uh, the question is uh, intertwined uh, in a way with the first question. Uh, all focusing on uh, privacy in machine learning, uh, ML in production. Uh, and uh, what are your thoughts briefly, maybe you could share with us? What do you think uh, we need to know about privacy uh, when it comes to machine learning uh, in production? Uh, briefly, you could share with us and then we'll get to see uh, what, if there are any other questions from more speakers, uh, from more attendees, uh, any new feedback? So, Timothy? Yeah, so maybe I'll answer this in two regards. So first, as a consumer um, that's uh, living in the modern world, and then secondly, as a as a, as a techie who, help, who helps develop these ML models. So uh, from a techie perspective, I think just only one thing, just make sure that uh, you got your back covered. Yeah, just try to adhere to the data protection uh, laws that govern uh, the jurisdiction that you are in. If you're doing work in, uh, for example, territories such as the EU, yeah, just try to align yourself and see that the work you're doing uh, is in line in tandem with the regulatory requirements. Yeah, all countries are coming up with laws, they're drafting them. So uh, I know an, uh, a model is as good as the data that's uh, put in it. So we always get excited when you get new sets of data, but then some of this data could land you in problems. So the issue of privacy is taken cognizant, I mean, it's taken uh, center stage at uh, this uh, point on edge. We also know that uh, when building uh, a lot of these ML models, uh, there's a, an expectation that uh, it's supposed to utilize less time, uh, less resources. Yeah, it's not a scientific project that you're doing for experiment. It's supposed to go into production. So uh, most of this, for example, the, my panelist was talking about the bio, biomedical application, our agricultural application of this. Yeah, so uh, the issues of uh, effects of a model in the output, yeah, so uh, we need to run, uh, for example, the confusion matrix and be able to understand what are the false positives. And uh, actually, even as you speak now, you can see uh, during this current crisis we are in for the COVID-19, uh, COVID uh, you can see that dynamic playing out very, very much. Yeah, so everyone trying to innovate, everyone trying to beat the rest in terms of coming up with a vaccine. Yeah, a lot of data being thrown. Yeah, so, but uh, you, just, you just don't know what's going on, yeah. So from a consumer perspective, I think for me, it's a matter of, uh, if you want privacy, then just stay offline, you know, because you can't run away from it. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, 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 surveillance tools out there that are gleaning on your data. Uh, there are a lot of uh, conversations that you're having uh, on your mobile app, on our web, on apps that are being recorded and they're being used to model uh, your behavior. And the metadata that's uh, being gleaned from those devices, again, uh, building your profile, we're talking about digital clones, things that are uh, 
uh, things that are affecting your decisions uh, uh, in the background. Yeah, so uh, privacy is uh, something that uh, is very key. It's going to be the, the game changer as we move forward. Yeah, so uh, as the previous panelist was talking about uh, the uh, the edge, uh, the edge, edge computing uh, growing. I think that's those are some of the interventions which are coming to address the issue of privacy. So we'll find a lot more uh, models uh, uh, coming to meet the data. Yeah, at the at the point of uh, where the data is being generated. Yeah, so that's uh, what I have to say about the subject of privacy. But then again, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity. Great, great. Uh, so at this point, I'll invite Ramash to give us, uh, share with us briefly what he has. Yes, thank you so much, Kennedy. And thank you, uh, Mr. Timothy, for that amazing session. I have an interesting question from a participant over here. As you just mentioned that uh, one of the recent paper, the Pulse paper, it uh, completely changed Barack Obama's picture and it was not even you know, closely related to what he looked like. It changed him into a white person. So it's basically, uh, as you said, that what uh, your model is basically what data it is trained on. So the question, a uh, really interesting question we have received is that the challenge in building effective machine learning uh, algorithms is based on the availability of the data. So how can a new startup, a small enterprise leverage the power of machine learning with just uh, sort of limited data? Please uh, briefly explain your thoughts about that. Cool. Yeah, so I think for me, we can talk about our journey. So what we've been able to do with the limited data is just being able to build uh, in, uh, entities of trust, yeah? So uh, first start with open data. I think we are continuously uh, living in a world where uh, the issue of uh, open data governance is uh, becoming more, um, more and more pronounced. So most, uh, uh, you find most the, uh, mature data repositories that are able to give you open data. But now what lacks is the innovation around that data. Now that unfortunately does not uh, require a techie yeah, to uh, give an outlook of what can be, what juices can be extracted to that data. So as a, as a small startup, I think one of the biggest successes has been able to collaborate with other professionals. So for example, psychologists, uh, anthropologists, sociologists, just to be able to create hypotheses around certain sets of data, even as much as it may be limited data, but we're able to drill through and come up with the various insights uh, that are able to be more uh, uh, ground ground shaking yeah, as we continue to win uh, uh, the influence uh, across different industries. Uh, for example, now things like weather data, I don't know whether you know this, but uh, weather correlates with uh, almost 80% of our uh, occurrences. Yeah? So it just be, it just depends on how creative you can you can get around it, yeah. So weather data is actually very huge data. And if you can be able to have that weather data and uh, build a model around it, then there's no door that you will knock and uh, provide them a solution, even if it's on a freemium model, and guys will not be able to listen to you, yeah. So it becomes so to answer you, it's about creativity. So don't worry about how big the data is; it's about smart. So we are talking about smart data. Okay, uh, thank you so much for that, Mr. Timothy. Uh, your, your, session, uh, your session has been uh, really helpful for all the participants, um, like from the beginners to the professionals. Thank you so much. Now, okay, uh, back to you guys. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much everyone for this opportunity. Uh, our next speaker is Sacheta Dea. Sacheta is an organizer of Women in Machine Learning and Data Science in Pioneer Community in India. Sacheta holds um, both Masters and Bachelor in Electronic Science. She is an ambassador in Women in, Machine, uh, Women in Data Science Community in the community, which a community which helps, helps in inspiring and educating women in who are shaping their career in data science globally. Sacheta will share with us more 
more in application of AI in her line of duty, explain in depth the reasons why many machine learning projects fail in production, and also she will explain some of the techniques and approaches of building interruptible machine learning models. At the end, before our session ends, I will hear from Sacheta as she explains to us some of the misconceptions surrounding AI. So at this time, I want to like I want to welcome Madam Sacheta. Uh, welcome, Madam Sacheta. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Great. Uh, good evening, everyone. Nice to meet you. So uh, should I read the question or? You, you can use uh, the best format of presentation that you're comfortable with. Okay. So I think the question I have is in your professional. Uh, should I read the question? Hello. Yes, uh, you can use uh, any mod that uh, you're comfortable with. Um, you can read, you can just... Okay, sure. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay, so I think the first question I have got is, in your professional network, uh, professional work, can you give some concrete example of applying AI and data science machine learning project to an, enter to an enterprise and how it worked? So I'm basically from telecom wireless background. And I have done a very large project uh, in the telecom sector, which used uh, uses AI, machine learning, and data science. And it was about the telecom networks planning. You know, we had to uh, plan the tower location uh, through remote study. So these are last mile villages. They are very far away with population less than 200, 500. And uh, they are very remote. They have challenges like terrain, you know, very poor infrastructure, power, and, you know, uh, only natural resources are available here. So very, very uh, difficult to even visit this. So this was a place where we use remote study. You know, we remotely uh, studied through this through high resolution satellite imagery, image, image recognition, uh, studying the rural topography, demography, socioeconomic conditions, and understanding the near ba nearby backbone networks. And through collating all this data and studying it, we arrived at the physical location of the tower in the villages and the coverage holes that exist. Means which are the areas where there is a population, but there is no network connectivity. So this was a huge project. And this analysis was done for 6,75,000 villages in India. And from that, we had tried to uh, analyze the coverage holes. So very significant impact in terms of socioeconomic conditions, business, revenue, and improving the life of people in that area. So this is the project which I have worked on. Uh, almost, you know, uh, aggregated and integrated and processed data from more than 1,000 sources. More than 1,000 sources for each state in India. And some Similarly, this was done for each state of India. So this is one enterprise projects which we have worked on. Can we go to the next question? Okay, so the next question is, in your opinion, uh, why do you think many machine lear learning projects fail in production? And then there is a specific example of you know, the case that, uh, that happened with Goldman Sachs. Okay. So uh, to answer the first part of the questions, you know, there are several reasons at several layers. You know, 
i have seen at startups there are different reasons and at you know a very matured organization the organizations like the big five like google microsoft amazon the reasons may be different but the the reasons are very different right from uh, you know the ability to scale the projects and large data sets uh, to ability to you know take the pro- solution to production beyond uh, pocs so this is uh, one of the reasons i have seen the second reason is a uh, lack of understanding uh, towards this domain data science most people feel that data science is either modeling or python programming or you know doing something with data but the end to end solution approach solution designing product designing approach is missing data science project is like any other project it has you know goals outcomes and it's any like any other product so the whole idea validation conceptualization you know everything that whole part is missed people just jump into implementing something these are some of the reasons when it comes to large organizations uh, specifically with respect to the case of goldman sachs i think uh, this is the case of bias so again a very common problem i have seen as a jury on hackathon in interviews and while mentoring people uh, people don't spend enough time to understand the data play with the data understand the relations correlations and in exploratory data analysis they directly jump into modeling and hence many time they miss several aspects of data or certain patterns or insights from data and sometimes i have also observed that many engineers they don't want to dirty their hands in data engineering and pre processing they just want the a clean data and they will just you know process it there is no fun you know it is 70 to 80% of a data science and machine learning project is data engineering right so these are some of the process or you know experience related issues uh, but when it comes to uh, big organizations like amazon or goldman sachs i in this case i feel the original you know some of the reasons are the original data itself is biased you know if the original data which we are using to train the model is biased then obviously the machine is also going to learn the biases so it is important to neutralize the data handle the biases and uh, that is why i according to me in big uh, organizations like uh, google and all there are special teams who constantly work study analyze and test and then uh, when it comes to specifically this in deep learning and uh, advanced neural networks due to large number of variables involved after a particular time the data scientists lose control over the application you know the functioning unlike in rule based programming i know at any instant what is happening inside but due to the serious le- uh, levels of layers involved and variables involved it is difficult to explain what is happening inside and how is the algorithm behaving and the most important thing what people do in absence of you know uh, enough information they certain, sometimes they use proxy criteria for programming you know and uh, sometimes there are biases induced by the programmer itself the data scientist itself because you know uh, they are un- unintentional they are unconscious biases but all of us have and by virtue of working in the same domain for a long time Uh, you know the decisions they take while selecting the features or even discarding a feature can induce biases so i think every case is different uh, but having expert advice from subject matter experts and domain experts and even people who have good business and market knowledge uh, is important because expert judgment is after all an expert judgment and uh, sometimes uh, you know the biases under question for example in this case gender uh they are not even used i think as per as what i had followed about this case the goldman sachs said that they are not even used gender for programming as an input which means that you know sometimes uh the idea of removing an input to eliminate bias is a very common and dangerous misconception <laughs> so you know it is entirely possible for algorithms to discriminate on gender even if they are programmed to be blind to that variable Uh, so you know eliminating not not considering that variable is not a solution to removing biases this is a dangerous misconception and uh, sometimes you know there are proxies for example if if i don't know what is your credit worthiness so how do i find out 
i find out which kind of restaurants you visit uh, what kind of electronics you buy or what kind of car you have so these are proxy criteria right but this may not always be true so these are some of the reasons i know uh, which can induce bias but again you know this depends from case to case solution to solution and sector to sector so it is important to study review and most importantly test this you know rigorously before we can release something in a market to avoid failures so these are some of my experiences can we go to the next question yeah i am concerned about the direction my project is going when is the right time to talk about ethics is it too late what are your thoughts on interpretable ai and ml biasness any techniques and approaches you would recommend practitioners to implement so i think biases we have discussed in the previous question let me talk about ethics so when it come to come to ethics i think you need to think about one needs to think about you know ethics at every stage of the project it is a continuous process it is an iterative process and it is an exploratory process at, right from solution conceptualization to data gathering to data processing to data governance to implementing the solution and the criteria we are using to implement a particular solution and right up to verifying the results and outcome you know sometimes we might uh, you know give uh, wrong uh, results and outcome so that also can be considered as you know uh, unethical so constantly being being clear on what we are doing why we are doing and how we are doing right and uh, having again i feel having experts and i think experts are there as far as you know companies like facebook and google are involved and uh, they do have experts who con continuously work on it and as far as facebook is concerned even after you know deploying the solution you know facebook is constantly monitoring what is right you know what are the limits what are the boundaries you know on the post and the data and the content that is published on website right so they also have their own you know criteria there are huge teams who continuously monitor what is right data what is wrong data which data should not be post which data should be censored so i think this is an ongoing process and sometimes you know playing a devil's advocate works you know it's called critical thinking you know it's wearing a black hat and seeing you know where my solution can fail how it can fail how it can be misused how it can be hijacked you know so ha having such systems and solutions in place to ensure that it cannot be misused also is a part of i think ethical thinking and uh, there are experts and uh, this is a subject in itself okay so according to me having dedicated teams and it's a continuous process and it changes from domain to domain right but a strong brainstorming and critical thinking is required in terms of uh, you know uh, the ethical values so ethic is a separate subject in itself so these are some of my uh, insights can we go to the next question okay so what are the myths around ai and are there any common misconceptions and how do we overcome them very interesting so uh, there is no limit you know to myths and mis misconceptions about ai again these are at different level right from you know what it is and is it something very harmful to human beings to how it is implemented how it works how it should be deployed again there are misconceptions at different level i would would like to handle a topmost you know as a technology as a concept you know the biggest misconception is it will take away your jobs and you know it will be better than human beings uh, it will uh, lead to destruction of enslavement enslavement of human race uh, you know because of uh, because robots become superior to us or ai is smarter than people and you know it will outpace human intelligence this is not true you know because it is human who is developing ai you it will never you know take that uh ai will make medical decisions and diagnosis but will not have an ultimate say so that is very important okay then another thing is you know machine learning using neural net means computer can learn the way humans learn no it is the humans who are training the programs you know how to learn right so these are some of the misconceptions in terms of the technology itself and then when it comes to implementation you know ai ops is predominantly based on event management 
companies don't need ai strategy no it is not true you know you need to even nowadays there are positions like chief aio like you have ceo so you have chief uh, you know ai officer also then algorithms can uh, make magical sense of your messy data no no algorithm cannot make sense you know it is all the data scientists who is programming cleaning and uh, asking the algorithm to learn and it is trained to learn and do what it is trained to do it cannot do magic okay so you need data scientists and machine learning experts and huge budgets to use ai business no not not at all you know i have worked on several projects uh, uh, which are proof of concepts uh, with without using you know a single uh, investment in the phase 1 because there's lot of open source information available and everything is available and um, so these are some of the misconceptions but how do we overcome them i think that is more important and the simplest way which i follow is focus on the incredible benefits and the power of ai focus on the positive positivity you know focus on what are the positive aspects of ai so according to me the biggest you know biggest strength of ai is where there are human limitations okay there are limitations on human strengths such as reach you know contact we have seen in the case of covid you know very high or low temperatures which a human body cannot withstand hazardous environment which can you know harmful conditions or threat to life like occupational hazards chemicals where human beings cannot even breathe you know human vision limitations you know uh, how much we can see at a time how many pixels we can see and the most important thing is human emotions human errors and moods you know these are some of the limitations of human being sometimes which create negative impact this is the power and this is where we can use the power of machines and ai this is one of the very important benefits of ai because these are the areas where there are unsolved problems in the industry in the business in the socio economic conditions then the second important thing is of course you know replacing or and or automating very or reducing you know drudgery mundane manual repetitive uh, they have you know they are slow in speed and there is not much learning there okay so this is one area where you know sometimes some skills may become redundant but always new skills new jobs and new skills are getting created but of course uh, community also we always highly promote reskilling and upskilling and then you know human beings have an amazing capability to see through the future right whatever we had imagined 20 years ago 50 years ago which we had seen in hollywood movies today we has we have seen that it has become a real and the quality of, just imagine an uber ride you know if everything goes right how seamless it is you know how easy it is to find a ride and you know travel along and just move out of the car without you know juggling for payments and other things right and the other the bigger than that you know the bigger than that i feel you know the power of technology is its ability to scale to reach masses scale very fast you know and the benefits are enormous to people who need the most and the people who are left behind the communities which are left behind like you know i say rural india because i have worked for villages you know they are deprived of basic necessities so they needed the most children sometimes women senior citizens physically challenged you know under privilege so these are the important people who have left behind and sometimes you know we can develop solutions we can develop enormous applications which can benefit and you know in general take everyone along and you know improve everyone's life you know and i feel according to that the biggest important sectors are agriculture healthcare and education so ai is doing and you know it will continue to do benefits and uh, you know uplift the society as a whole so i think we should not worry about you know disadvantages uh, we should look at the powers we should look at the positive aspects and see how we can benefit from them and of course you know uh, we cannot uh, we should never think of how we can misuse you know how we can develop something which can be harmful to human beings right so that's not the benefit of ai so i think we should focus on positives we should understand the risks 
and you know impact on us and prepare accordingly a uh, reskilling and upskilling is the need of time especially the pe people who work on high end technologies i think they, we need to continuously learn continuously you know brush up and learn new things because innovation research is continuously happening so these are some of my answers to the question Good. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Shu Cheta, for taking us through the particular session and also getting to share with us uh, informative insights uh, and also getting to share with us your knowledge. Uh, we really learned a lot and we do greatly appreciate it. Uh, and uh, at this point, I'll welcome Ramash to take us through the next session. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Kennedy. And thank you, Sucheta, for that amazing and informative session about biases in AI and what's happening. I would quickly just like to take this moment to let the participants know that uh, I have, we have received nine polls for the first question. Uh, we hope that that could have been increased. But for uh, as a matter of time, we would like to now move over to the second uh, question. So we'll move over to the second poll now, which will be activated, which will be what is your knowledge and understanding of machine learning after attending this event. Uh, so we hope that we will be able to see a significant increase in the knowledge and understanding that attendees would have developed after uh, hearing from so many speakers and after hearing the other speakers and panelists that will be coming forward from this point onwards. So, and we will be doing more questions and answers later on. So with that being said, let's move over to the next session. Okay, back to you guys, thank you. Hello everyone. Hello everyone. I'm Tanvi Thanekar and I will be presenting Jacqueline Be Betty. Jacqueline is working as a data incubator associate at K uh, KPMG East Africa and is a gastronomy reviewer. She has done her master's in time series change point analysis and business analytics. Her talks are based upon career focus skills and entrepreneurship with students and organizes the workshops. She believes in women empowerment and strongly commends young women to work towards STEM and apply the skill sets. She is working towards East Africa's women leadership and inculcating the social impact towards society. Some of the fun facts are to be shared for uh, Miss Jacqueline will be like at a young age of 10, she had a 3M Littman classic to pediatric stethoscope as she was keen for uh, studying medicine. And secondly, she was denied entry at Schengen area and no refund on her ticket at remote airport. And her family still makes fun of her. Quite interesting. A very warm welcome to you, Jacqueline. Over to you. Hello. Hi, Tanvi. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll just get right to it. Thank you also for highlighting the things that my family still make fun of me for. Uh, we'll just get right to the to the first question. Thank you. Uh, maybe you can put it up on the screen. Sure. Right. So uh, I've been thinking about this uh, question a lot, largely because um, I get asked by people who are already in, you know, pursuing certain career paths and students in school. And uh, I'll just like to answer the first part, which is the educational path as to, you know, which one you should choose if you're looking to get into R&D uh, in AI. I'd just like to say um, that this question carries a lot of weight, largely because as you've noticed from all the speakers who've spoken, uh, Sanika, Timothy, um, all the speakers who've spoken so far, it's just about data. There's no AI without data. And luckily, we, we've been generating data before AI was invented in 1955 or thereabout. So as to the educational path that one should uh, follow, um, we do have cases of uh, people changing courses uh, three years into a five-year course and switching into, say, computer science or computer engineering. And... Um, I just like to say that it's never too late and it's important to always focus on your personal goals and don't really feel the pressure of conforming. Um, as Sanika had mentioned uh, on the uh, what to do in AI, her, her, her skill set so far and the idea and the fact that we're all still learning and we're all still growing. 
um, it's important that you find your niche and truly just sit down with yourself and ask yourself, what is it that I'm really trying to do? And the reason why this is such an important thing is that AI is not going anywhere one and we'll cover uh, some of the myths about AI being at its peak. It's not. There are three stages to AI. There's the weak AI, general AI and strong AI, which Sunik also mentioned. So we're, we're still at a weak AI. That means there's, there's, a, there's a lot of room for you to explore. Just don't feel too... Uh, there's no need to conform, truly. Just sit down and ask yourself, what is it I'm trying to do? If you're trying to be someone who can work with data, anyhow, any tool, then the first thing you'd Google is what are the common tools for data science, data analytics, uh, machine learning, and then start looking at what is it I'm supposed to be, do to be doing? Because um, there's this notion that you should just jump right in. And the previous speaker specifically mentioned, and this is a problem that analysts uh, and data scientists and modelers have, is you have a lot of data and you just want to go straight into the modeling. You have to go back and trace back your steps and establish your problem statement. This is applicable in real life. So as to answering this question as to what career path you should choose or what educational path you should choose, this is a personal question. Sit down, frame your statement. Am I happy in this course? Is it what I really want to do? And the, I'd like to also disrupt the idea that you have to solely follow traditionally um, analytical skills focused courses. That's not the case. We have people in law trying to um, implement AI solutions, and that's what we. That's that's the that's the best news you can ever have as a as an AI enthusiast is that you want people to understand that it's broader than all the misconceptions that they have about it. it it's boundless, and that should go into informing you that regardless of where you are, which is largely the problem I've, I've had with people asking me this question, is that they feel like it may be, may be a bit too late to change or might, the learning curve might be a bit too steep. But here's the headline, that's life. And you have to prioritize yourself and your goals and say, okay, um, I do want to do AI. Uh, what is AI? What is machine learning? What is deep learning? What are, what are algorithms? What are key data sets? What are the issues surrounding the kind of data that I use, which have, which have also been discussed by previous speakers? You want, you want to look into common licenses. You want to look into, uh, you know, all of these things uh, come into play. So truly just sit down with yourself and ask yourself what you're trying to do. But the traditional sense is, you know, analytical focused uh, courses, if you're still in school, that is computer science, computer engineering, business analytics. I did my uh, postgrad in business analytics. My undergrad was in actual science. Now, you know, if, if, you, if you don't have any knowledge about actual science, your question would be, why would you make that jump? And you could have been an actuary as opposed to anything in analytics. Well, the truth is that both of those skills require a lot of analytical skills. They require critical thinking, they require problem solving, and the truth of the matter is that data is everywhere. There's no escaping that. Whether or not you're working in a qualitative field or quantitative field, there's no escaping. Both of those kind of data types are still um, used deeply for analysis. And that's one of the issues that was being raised about um, inculcating, rather implementing EQ in AI, that's where a lot of this qualitative data comes through. So really, the, the field is wide, um, it's boundless, and it's open to everyone. Whether or not you're working or whether you're still in school, just ask yourself, what do I want to do? And then move from there. Just remember, Google is your friend, one, two. It's important that you've given yourself, you've invested in your future by joining us this uh, webinar find more like this and then join communities and if, if that's a bit difficult for you uh, maybe by your personality type or just you just you know for other issues then find people in the network or uh, you know isolate these people in on, on linkedin find the the speakers find the hosts and you know shoot them questions on linkedin shoot them questions on the chat and that's how you move forward that's you that's the worst thing you can do is not do that's it. So I think there's room for everyone. I think we can move on to the next question. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, this, uh, I love this question because um, I've had exposure in different industries and I've worked with different people um, working on completely different things, but the center of it was data. Now, my response to which department, which corporate 
department would be you know most impacted by ai i mean the first question here is what's the time frame for me it'd be you know a year to three years max uh, that's the time frame i'm looking at as to you know which department has been most impacted by ai and my response to this is largely um centered it's largely anchored on which business units which departments in any corporate setting do management have sort of a, a lax risk um, attitude towards um, what i mean by this is think of customer service in the 1980s to the 19 i want to say 50s to 80s there think about customer service so these were none termed things uh, we know what customer service is now um, in the past, maybe it wasn't known as that. It was just like, what did the customer say? You know, it wasn't really anchored to a situation or a term that we can use and, you know, talk about it in boardrooms. So in that kind of space, you have a bit of leniency because it's not really directly related to the business model. Um, I've, I've seen this in the, the different people I've worked with and the different industries I've worked in. Uh, customer service is uh, it's almost like a by the way. And it's such a problem because we end up collecting so much data that is so rich. I mean, I remember looking at a 50,000 row uh, Excel workbook that had like 20 columns. And in one column, it was largely sentiment data. It was qualitative data rather. And it was paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs of students saying, very particular things about administration, about services at the school. It was a school. And to me, that is valuable. But if you don't have the kind of expertise or the knowledge to know that there's an expert who can look at this kind of data and make sense of it for us, that's a problem. So there is that notion that if it's not directly related to our business model, then we have a bit of leniency there. Sure, go implement an algorithm there. Tell us what you find. And sometimes in the African market, they do not take it seriously. Uh, as Timothy mentioned, um, with predictive analytics, there's this sort of resistance by traditional um, attitudes into adopting anything to do with AI or ML. And that's a problem. And it is that underlying notion that would lead me to say that anything that is not directly related to their business model, particularly if a company has been around for at least 40 to 50 years, that's where you'll, you'll find a lot of resistance to change and adoption of AI. Um, but in startups, this, this, all of this categories here, marketing, customer service, all of these things could be largely affected by AI, uh, particularly from the beginning. And you know, we're already in a time period where this is a topic of discussion. But in traditional settings, they would largely lean on to, yeah, this is not, this will not really affect our shareholders or this, you know, all of that stuff. There are more like investments, portfolios, all of that stuff. So in terms of qualitative data, not really. And that's where you find things like um, people like Jumia Food and Uber um, employing things, the, what are they called? Chatbots. And they work pretty well. Uh, unfortunately, like for me, sometimes I'm not sure if I'm speaking to an actual human being or a chatbot and and I think that's I think that's a problem but yeah for sure I think customer service is well on its way onto you know being a most impacted especially in the African market in the next two to three years um, perhaps you can move on to the next one yes uh, I do have a I can give one let me just give one concrete example of applying AI and I, I, I chose this particular um, example largely because it, everything about it has been highlighted by previous speakers so when they were all speaking i was just nodding my head very vigorously because i relate to everything and i just like before i give the example i just like to bring the issue of data privacy and data concerns and data protection and the data protection act of 2018-19 thereabouts um it's true. It's true what uh, what the speaker said, what Timothy said, that, you know, ethics will take a back seat when you're making decisions based off of your your models, your algorithms, your AI, your ML solutions. And it's the truth. So in in a very lightly regulated manner in the East African market with regards to data protection, it's a problem. Um, for me and you, if you if you've sub subscribed to any um, service or product or email newsletter for a country in the UK or in Europe or in the States, I challenge, like, I, this is just, just test this. 
just go email them and the headline should be data deletion or you know just expunge my records just remo- i don't want to exist in your database it is such a serious problem but in this market um i could give one example we have a local bank uh, a friend of mine went to check her balance and it was minus uh, 200 dollars uh, plus and she, this this record didn't make sense to her this transaction did not happen i did not go to this place i don't understand where this money is gone and so it's been over seven months. The company's yet to address this to her and she's not the only person. So again, uh, this ties back to the previous question on customer service. There are this truths that we, would, we don't want them to exist. They're not ideal as anyone in AI, as anyone working in data, as anyone who's passionate about doing the right way about things, going about, going about the right way in, do, in doing things. Um, it's problematic. So let me just, I want you to just have that in mind on the data privacy and data protection thing. So this one concrete example is a model I built for employee churn, so attrition models. So basically just think of it, it was, um, I ran a series of models, about eight models. I did both unsupervised and supervised machine learning. And the idea is that you have records of data and they're labeled. So of course, in unsupervised, you will drop the label, the column saying this person left, this person is still at the company. So it was a binary classification problem. It's either you're with us or you're not with us. And um, it wasn't too complex as such when I was working with the dummy data because um, you know, we didn't have like anchor dates. So I can say, I want to focus this. So I didn't go into the forecasting period, which is important, by the way. Um, I think it's important that whenever you have um, an analytics problem, just sit down and frame the question. I just like at this juncture, just to mention something. There's something called the Powell and Bats four stage process. This is where your first phase, it's very simplistic and it's applicable anywhere, whether it's AI or not, whether it's your personal life. The first step is to frame the problem. The second step is to diagram the problem. And then the third step is to build your model if you're coding or actual model building. And then the fourth one, generate insights, right? It sounds very basic, but I will now tell you the example um, that I'm speaking of and why the first the first phase about framing your, your problem statement is important. So when I built the attrition model, the idea was to do exactly that. Just tell me whether this person will stay with us or they'll leave. Now, two questions come to mind. What are the key indicators? Who, who, is, the, who, is, the, who is the particular person that would leave the firm? So you'd have indicators like um, their age or their marital status or where they went to school or what they did for undergrad or their current role or how many years they've spent with their current performance manager. You'd think that these things are not important, but they are. You have other variables like what are the, what is their skill on a, how they feel about a work-life balance? What is the environment satisfaction? All these things come to play. What is their business travel frequency? Um, it, it, it sounds complex, but it really isn't when it comes down to the reality of dropping the model and inserting it into you know, real life business decision making. And so the problem here could be two way. And the previous speaker, I, again, I, I was just really excited just to hear this. Um, th- it's two way. You want to think about the positive uh, effects of AI that we will be able to solve problems. We will be able to do this and this and just positively impact our communities and the people we work with right now the problem with building an attrition model is um it can go two way my my the 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 path we're following i'm assuming that if any of our clients were to uptake this then this would be you know something that would have to be laid down by law but it's two way and this is a problem statement i put forward what are the remedies that we can put in place what are the policies that we can put in place as to keeping this particular person who is likely to leave us. And then management would say something like, well, this is important, but can you give us a similar model for key man risk? Now, that is, that is where you want this, this conversation to go. Because if you're looking at key man risk, then you're saying, well, this, we only have two people who do this very specialized role. Um, if they're likely to leave, it's a problem. So that takes away the weight. And this is important. It takes away the weight of saying, what about the new people we're hiring who would look like these people? It takes away that weight because this is a two-way um, pitchfork. This is the issue. You want to think positive AI, but it also has, um, unfortunately, negative impacts. Not the AI itself. I, 
obviously the problem is with the people who use the solution. And of course, it brings about a bigger question about who are we as people? What's, what are our core values? What do we value the most? What kind of people are we? And who actually has access to this kind of solutions? And who gives that access? And who is this person? And what are they like? So delving into that kind of um, abyss is... It, it kind of it's it's kind of uh, numbing and paralyzing because you want to have an ideal state, you want to have a utopic state of matters and affairs, but it's very difficult. And the truth of the matter is that good and bad exist, good and evil exist in the world as is. So whatever AI solutions you put out there, someone will find a way to go to the other side, the dark side of things, and and try to exploit whatever system they're trying to exploit. So the two-way thing I'd like just come to come back to the attrition model is one, it could just be about remedying the situation. What new policies can we keep? Do we need to pay them more? Do we need to increase uh, vacation days? Do we need to evaluate our performance managers more? What are the what are the factors that we could look at um, in particular from the models? They said, okay, it seems like people who travel more leave faster. So then how do we manage that? And what kind of travel is that? Is that just Uber or is it also flights included? And what kind of flights? Is it within the East African community? Is it long-term flights? Is it What is it? And it's very possible to get these answers. But then this, the, 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 the other side of it is, um, if if not well monitored, if you know documents are not signed, it could also very easily go to, well, for our new hires, uh, we notice that you're of this age and this age, and and you, you're like this, and you 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 exhibit this kind of uh, you know characteristics. Uh, so they would obviously not tell you that they were not they're not going to give you the job because. Uh, of these factors that they got from a model, of course not. But that's a problem, and that's a real reality. That's a that's a fact. Um, algorithms and solutions do have this kind of effect, and so you want to monitor that, and you want to truly evaluate yourself as the owner of that solution. So again, reverting back to the Powell and Bats uh, process, just focus on framing your problem statement from the very beginning and communicate that very effectively. As Timothy said, you want to watch your back when it comes to data privacy and data protection. That's truly what it is, but just think of it as, it's not something you need to do as protecting your back if you're more focused on doing the right thing from the beginning. So I guess uh, that's what I'd say on that. Perhaps you can move on to the next question. Right. So I, so I believe this is the, the uh, one of the, the, I suppose, the last question, the myths around AI. Um, I think I'd start with the one that I mentioned before, is that there's this fear that we, we're at uh, peak AI. Oh, you know, so, you know, a lot is happening. Uh, a lot of people are losing jobs. The truth of the matter is that people have been losing jobs for a while. Um, whether it's re with regards to economic cycles, whether it's regards to, I don't know, uh, filing for bankruptcy, all these things happen. And so when you include an unknown factor, people who are not non-tech, who do not you know, have a full grasp on what AI does, then for sure, I, I would be scared. I, I was a believer of that until I started getting into this and getting a bit more excited and doing a bit more research. And um, that's the idea. So if you have this strong feeling that we're, we're super into AI at the moment, then it's not, it's, it truly isn't truthful. And uh, I just encourage anyone to just do a bit more research about the three stages of AI. And Sanika had mentioned this, uh, weak AI, which is where we're at, uh, and then moving on to general AI, where you, you're able to improve your AI via the emotional quotient route, as opposed to IQ, where you have your numbers and all of that stuff. Um, yeah, just do a bit more research on that. And the last stage after general AI is strong AI, and that's where um, you know, we we'll, we'll, can say we're at our peak, but at the moment, we're truly not. That's myth number one. Myth number two that I've uh, mentioned in the first one is, you know, the job reduction thing. It really isn't true. Like, we, you need human beings to build these solutions. You need people to monitor what the solutions are putting out. I'll give one strong example, two strong examples. Um, there was a classification of, I think it was either Google or Nokia or... Nikon, I don't know, I think it was Nikon or Google, one of those two. And the issue was that um, 
any photographs in your library uh, would in just black people, it would classify those as animals. And so you want, you know, people who don't have an understanding of this would say, oh no, the company is racist and all this. But the truth of the matter is it comes down to data. We do not have that kind of representation in data for black people, black races, different variations of brown skin. You know, like th this is, it's not a, it's not systemic from this, the point of view of the company. It's systemic from where the data came from. So, and I recall IBM scraping off of, uh, I think it was Facebook photographs. Um, while illegal, I can understand that that's a much wider, <laughs> that's a much wider data set. I'm not advocating for it, but if we're, if we're going to reduce this diversity issue, we need more photographs of black people. And it's someone, someone is sitting down behind a computer looking at these allegations and people publishing articles about them, going back to the model and saying, oh, wait, and, you know, and then going back to the data source and looking at the parameters and all lines of code and just trying to see where is it that they could have gone wrong. And this is why we will forever need human beings, you know, until we get to maybe general to strong AI, uh, I, I suppose. And maybe on the third and last myth I'd like to talk about is that there's this idea that AI is new. Um, and I remember the, the first person who talked about, um, and the first person I, I interacted with who spoke about uh, Bitcoin, th there was this idea that it's new, not Bitcoin, that was relatively new, but the idea of a, what's it called, a peer system, as opposed to, a, it's a decentralized system as opposed to a centralized system. And it was, there's this feeling and, you know, just fake news all around that all of these things are new and that way it's a bit scary, you know, but we have been doing, we have been carrying out AI task, ML tasks beforehand. And I think the, the logical um, example here would be in logistics. Um, think about your common old time classic algorithm, the traveling salesman problem. This, it, it has been named so because it is an old problem. It's, you with several insurance contracts, for example, you've been given a few cities to hit or a few locations, and you've been told this is your budget for the day, this is your time constraint, these are the number of contracts you need to sell. And of course, as a human being, you know, you'll probably need a pee break, you'll need your lunch break, you need to travel, you need to have fuel constraints. So maybe the way we've gone about solving problems via the tools side is a bit different. And the refining of algorithms and you know, including more data sets into the same problem and making it a bit more wholesome is probably what is a bit new. And that's expected because, you know, changes growth, you know, new data, therefore retrain the same model, it becomes a bit more refined. Your results become a bit more refined and that's expected in any field. If you're growing, you're generating more data, therefore you can refine your algorithms and your machine learning uh, solutions. And I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. It was a very um, amazing and informative session. And thank you so much for your valuable time today. We are glad to have you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Tanvi. It was great talking to you guys. So now um, we'll go to the Q&A session. Um, over to you, Ramanj. Yes. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Tanvi. Thank you so much, uh, Jacqueline, for that amazing session. Let me just quickly share my screen over here to ask the question. Okay. Uh, yes, Jacqueline. So, uh, you know, like uh, you talked about basically all the important things in your informative session. Like they, those were some uh, really interesting points that you were mentioning around all the different areas of or AI. But we also have one research related question that we think we will be able to uh, really answer well, that how should students who are building their knowledge in machine learning, who are doing online courses, making small programs, you know, how can they move towards research and writing their first uh, research paper, what are the nice steps, what are the logical steps to take that path? All right, thank you so much. Uh, this is a great question. Um, I like it largely because of the go about side. How do you go about building your knowledge? And uh, I think even for me, uh, what I was doing my, what I'm trying to say is that you'll get to a point in time and you'll go back and look at any point in your academic life, anytime you've been exposed to anything academic where you learned 
the most, i.e., what was your most effective method of learning? So what I'm trying to say is that um, you might talk to someone that might say, yeah, YouTube videos work for me and they work for them and there's no invalidating that. But then you still have to find what works for you. Um, personally, I, I know uh, nothing works for me if it's not problem centered. That's how I go about building my knowledge about anything that I don't know about. I need a problem. And this is why I really liked uh, Timothy's uh, approach in the predictive analytics, um, predictive analytics lab when they're going about facilitating learning sessions is you have to come with a business problem. That way it becomes so much easier to grasp something because you came with your attention on lockdown. It's fully focused. There's something you're trying to achieve. So my advice to you on building your knowledge is, first of all, find your most effective learning method, whether it's flashcards, whether it's actual coding, whether it's learning the language coding from scratch, which I honestly don't advise. <laughs> I advise that you go through the problem first and then, you know, go about learning the algorithm itself. That way, you'll know what to do and what not to do. And if you don't know, Stack Overflow still exists. So many other community uh, forums. And you, know, you can also tap into your resources and your networks. And I guarantee you, I'm yet to meet a, a selfish person <laughs> in the AI industry because we're still largely growing. And uh, anywhere, actually, generally as a continent, as a world, we are still growing. So just try and find your best learning method and then move from there. Um, how can you move forward? Uh, how can you move towards research? The best way to this for me, um, I try to, I don't say exploit, but it really is exploiting. But I try to exploit the kind of connections I have. The reason I say this is because you will not know what business problems exist out there if you're a student unless you find someone who knows that or is working themselves. And so you have to put yourself out there. I know networking events can be awkward, which is why COVID is such a great way to meet people because you don't have to meet them in real life. So um, try and tap into your network and get those business problems from them. That's how you start writing concept papers, white papers. That's how you, you get into solving problems. And that's how you get into research. And this is even before opening your laptop to program or code or model anything. Purely research. You will need a goal. You will need your problem statement set beforehand. And to get that problem statement beforehand, if you don't have it, uh, maybe you do have one, maybe from your interactions with life in general. Maybe you've seen uh, people spend too much time in the waiting line at hospital A as opposed to hospital B. Um, what is the issue here? Because hospital A probably has, uh, they have more staff members around and hospital B has fewer ones. So what is the, wh what am I missing here? That could be a business problem to solve and you could get into research. You could get into something we call um, heuristics and optimization. And this is way before you get into actually modeling. You get to know a lot about the concepts that are you know, particular to the kind of problem you're trying to solve. So my advice to you on the learning, get to understand your personal learning method, your most effective learning method. And onto research, try and attach yourself to someone who has a high exposure into business problems. That way you have an end goal in mind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacqueline, for that. That was a really nice answer to this question, like both the parts. I think uh, what we can take away most importantly from that answer is that we should be comfortable. We should force ourselves to network with our peers, network with speakers and professionals so that we can learn about a goal that we can work towards and slowly move towards research. And uh, even that Stack Overflow is still alive, we should be actively using it. Uh, thank you so much for that. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, back to you guys. Thank you, Ramash. Thank you, team. Thank you, Tanvi. Thank you, so much. Thank you Jacqueline. Thank you, Jacqueline, for this informative um, session. So now moving to the next presenter. Um, he, his name is Im Imad Khan. Imad Mohammed Khan is a, is a data scientist at Wahan and is a founder of Mantisa Data Science Meetups, which operates in four Indian cities like Bangalore, Hyderabad, Mumbai, and Pune. He also creates data science related uh, content on LinkedIn and YouTube and always helps students with career guidance. He has done his master's in internet technologies and informa information systems from TU Braunschweig in Germany. Some of the fun techo facts regarding him is like 
he prefers python over r language t over coffee and data over opinions a very warm welcome to you mr aimar over to you thank you tanvi thank you for having me today thank you everybody uh, involved in organizing this event uh, maybe we could get started with the slides all right so the first question that was presented to me beforehand was how does the hiring process look for a machine learning engineer slash data science slash data engineer role what best advice would you give to the audience on data science transition talent preparation and hiring so i will not bore you with a long sermon here i know you've been uh, listening to a lot of speakers a lot of a uh, lot of interesting points and view points have already been shared with you so i'm just going to give a couple of points to each of these questions and hopefully that will help you understand uh, what i would what what's my opinion on this so first of all on this question these are two or three different roles right so a data engineer's role is different from a data scientist's role versus a machine learning engineer's role so every role has its own process uh, data engineer's role is essentially how do you build the data pipelines in the organization that will allow your data scientists to work effectively so in the case of a data engineer the hiring process would essentially look like do you uh, understand how you do you understand do you know how to build data pipelines do you understand big data technology what's your proficiency in terms of engineering sides of things right so it's more focused towards can you build systems that can transfer data from one place to another can you work with databases can you work work with backend engineering so those are the kind of skill sets that you would be tested in the case of a data engineer and for a data scientist it it is a bit different the hiring process uh is focused more towards your mathematical skill your programming knowledge your domain knowledge a combination of all these three things uh is what you're tested on uh, for a data scientist role uh, i have detailed this in 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 one of my youtube videos so if uh, you would like to know more please uh, head over there uh, for a machine learning engineer now i think there's a lot of uh, from what i've been seeing there's a lot of confusion on what is machine learning engineer itself so i would i essentially like to think of machine learning engineer as somebody who is uh, working uh, with machine learning algorithms trying to improve the 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 problem you're trying to solve using machine learning algorithms and keep continuously iterating over your results to keep improving the system itself the machine learning system that you have so it's like a hybrid data scientist data engineer role in my mind with a focus towards machine learning so there of course you have a mix of data engineer related questions and data science related questions what best advice would i give somebody to tra who's transitioning i think uh, you should know that it takes time it's not something that you can do uh, in a few weeks or months uh, it takes some time for you to get up to speed with all the different technologies that are being used in the industry so please do not expect to become i mean a lot of uh, ads are fl float around floating around saying that you can become a data scientist in one month i don't think that's realistically possible so be prepared to uh, take your time learning these technologies and uh, yeah it's, it's it's a process it takes some time uh, talent preparation so essentially you prepare yourself and hiring i think for companies there's a lot of advice uh that can be given about the kind of talent they are looking to hire and uh, first of all know what you want to do with the data that you have uh and really understand the data space well you don't expect uh, all data to be gold right so there there is uh good data and bad data that exists so understand that and uh, hire effectively that way so this is a short answer to this question we can go further to the next question how does one become a good or skilled ai researcher in the field of ai ml dl so i'm not a researcher but i did my masters of course where i had to do some research so i have had some interaction with researchers and from what i have seen uh, about research is that you have two kinds of research essentially one is the theoretical 
for fundamental research and the second is applied research. So try and understand which kind of research do you want to do, uh, even in the field of AI, ML, DL. Um, there are a lot of branches of research that you could pursue. Uh, fundamental research focuses on f fundamentally improving uh, the state of the art of the algorithms that are in use or even devising new algorithms, right? Uh, and in the case of an applied researcher, you would work towards applying current algorithms that, that exist uh, out there in, in knowledge, in, uh, in, in, in research to different areas and different domains. So your skill sets will vary. If you are a fundamental researcher, you would, or theoretical researcher, you would have to be strong in mathematical areas uh, and understand areas like probability, statistics, calculus, because you're essentially trying to look for newer patterns, newer areas where you can combine architectures and, and look at something, developing something absolutely new uh, as an algorithm. But for an applied researcher, it's about understanding the gaps that exist uh, in, in the knowledge today, in, in, in research today, and uh, trying to see if there's something that you can apply these methodologies to. So that's a short answer to this question as well. Let's move on. What actionable plans, words of wisdom, tactics, and strategies would you share with the audience on how to advance and excel in this highly dynamic and evolving data world whilst building strong and impressive portfolios? This is a very interesting question. I think uh, I would like to pick up from where Jacqueline said, uh, the previous speaker said that the world, uh, everybody loses jobs and people have been losing jobs ever since uh, technology has come into play because technology comes in, replaces some jobs and creates a lot of new jobs, right? So the world is dynamic that way and data is data science, AI, ML is exactly doing what uh, the, the say the sewing machine did a few years back, right? Not few, hundred, hundreds of years back. So it's really important to understand technological advances and keep moving towards so uh, I think there is, there's, uh, there's an Indian entrepreneur who called Kunal Shah. He talks about how do you move, uh, how do you create something which is about Delta Phi, which is something once you move there, you would not like to come back to the previous state because the newer state is so much better than the previous state. So identify technologies that take you to that state. And now this is a bit more theoretical, but what I'm essentially saying is if there is a change that is happening in the world and if that change is sustainable and uh, overall it creates wealth of possibilities and overall it creates good, then ideally you would want to be there. So identify that, see how things are changing around the world and uh, look at opportunities that way. So identify exponential technologies, identify things that are taking the world from zero to one and get yourself associated with that and that will help allow you to be uh, aligning with the dynamic changing world. So this is another short advice on how you can keep evolving uh, in this rapidly changing world. Can we move on? Okay, so in my opinion, what do I think? Why do I think many machine learning projects fail in production and what advice would I give to future machine learning engineers? Uh, a lot of this ties back to data because algorithms right now are commodity in many cases, right? So if you see uh, almost everyone in the industry uses standard packages that are available via scikit-learn or, or your TensorFlows, your PyTorches, all of these are to a lot of extent uh, commoditized. But where does the difference come in? The difference actually comes in with the way you represent your data. And uh, if you are... If you, if, if you introduce, and there are multiple ways of representing data, right? You might uh, involuntarily introduce a selection bias in your data. And one example I like to give about this is the, 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 the image recognition system uh, that Google Photos had initially developed. If, if, I'm wrong, if, if I'm right, it's Google Photos or some other Google product where it was not able to identify person of color accurately and it was tagging uh, them to a wrong category, right? So this 
even though the, the the machine learning engineer or the developer of the product did not intend to do that this is an unintended consequence of not having a representative training data set which essentially is a selection bias in your data set so look in look at your training data sets uh, try and and one of the examples here is also about uh, discrimination against women right so even though the way you even though you might be representing the uh, representing data the way it exists in real life there might be discrimination in real life too right so and how do you how do you how do you tackle that and now it becomes a more question more a question of uh, are you doing the right thing by actually taking the data set the way it appears in real life so make sure your your data set is free of biases free uh, is ethical so this is one one reason of course one another reason of course is a uh, situation like covid that nobody really so i think more than 100 i mean not more than 100% but more than 60 to 70% of all models across companies must have failed in their forecast of let's say sales your marketing uh, budgets and all of those forecasts must have failed in the last couple of months right so all, all these are all machine learning projects that are failing in production why because the data has changed now because of all the lockdowns and everything around the world the data itself the, the process that was generating data has changed now and in a sense the patterns that you were trying to capture are no longer being created and that's why your project is failing so this is uh, really it's very tricky right so data keeps changing all the time and you have to keep yourself up to speed uh, so i think these are few points uh, on how you can be aware of uh, introducing unintended biases in your system and how you can keep uh, your production systems updated all the time right thank you so much thank you so much for your valuable time today uh, iman we are uh, really appreciate your your sharing uh, knowledge with us thank you so much now let's go to the q and a uh, session with ramansh over to you yes thank you so much tanvi and thank you mr imad for that amazing and wonderful session let me just quickly head over to slido okay mr imad uh, so after that session like i think uh, one of the most uh, crucial questions uh, we can ask right now uh, is that what suggestions would you give for aspiring entrepreneurs who wish to create ai startups and how does covid 19 play into all that if they if they're moving through that phase right now if you can share some thoughts on that please sure yeah it's, a, it's an interesting question so i think ai startups like i said at the core is about can you get that data right if you can get that data that nobody else has and build something on top of it then there's nothing like it because like i said most algorithms are now commoditized and if you get access to a certain set of data that nobody else can and build in loops such that your product keeps improving with you continu continuously collecting data then there's nothing like it so that is one way of building an ai startup another way would be go ahead and introduce a new methodology or new algorithm which is of course the harder way uh, in terms of uh, developing something i mean of course getting access to uh, unique data is also not easy but that that takes more of social engineering effort versus the second wave which is coming up with something entirely new which will take you a technical breakthrough so i think these two ways are something that i see okay uh, thank you so much for that mr mat that was an amazing answer and we understand uh, it, it, the entrepreneurship of ai startups kind of better now i would do, i would like to take this moment to also remind the participants and the attendees to make sure that they are voting on the second poll we have not received uh, that many polls on the second question yet so if you can please head over to the slido link and answer it will be really helpful for us thank you so much back to you guys great um thank you so much romash kennedy and uh, lydia tanvinik for having uh, 
driven us through the session um, quite well and uh, quite more interactive and informative to our, our speakers. Uh, we want to say thank you so much. We do appreciate you having creating time to share with us from your wealth of experience, knowledge, and expertise today. So from the Deep Learning AI Ambassadors, we want to say thank you so much. And we hope to see you more next time for similar such sessions and for different other topics related to AI and deep learning. So do Thank remember you, to, do remember to um, take part in the live poll. Uh, check follow up emails next week to redeem the deep learning AI coupon codes, uh, courses on Coursera, and also predictive analytics lab um, coupon codes that will be shared with you. Uh, that will come over next week. So um, at this point, I'd love to um, have us end the session with uh, the specialization video, the NLP specialization video. So Kennedy, maybe once, Good, uh, just a short while, we shall... Just a short while, we As we wait to get to uh, uh, have the video shortly, I would like to encourage uh, uh, those of us as we've uh, had and learned a lot from our speakers, uh, uh, those who have uh, interests and are quite excited towards uh, the NLP uh, field. You've heard from our speakers of how the field is really um, innovating and coming up uh, with um, innovative solutions. So this would uh, be one of the best NLP specializations out there. And uh, we will briefly just get to hear the message from uh, uh, Dr. Andrew and Jean, why he feels that uh, this is the best set of courses out there that you should embark on. Uh, and the good thing, as you said, is that uh, each and every, each attendee uh, and also uh, will be having a one month free access to the set of courses. So uh, let's just get to hear the message. Uh, and, uh, the specialization was launched on 17th, uh, just eight days ago. Uh, just uh, getting to hear the message. Ramash, uh, maybe you could get one question for for either Mwenda or Jacqueline, who's still on the call, and Aymad, or when Kennedy tries to set up. Yeah. Um, one second. Okay.
I do I do have one question. Uh, if I can present it, Griven, would that be all right? Yeah, that, that'd be great. Uh, so you know, one of the questions we also received earlier was that uh, how can we apply the how can we apply the field of data science and machine learning in the education industry to not only impact the students to learn in a better way but also uh, have them get into this field themselves? If someone can answer that. Mwenda, would you take on this question? Briefly. All right, all right. Let me let me attempt. Let me attempt it. Um so tell me about data science application in uh, education in the industry. So well, one 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 application is actually what you get to, to use like every other thing that is Coursera, Udacity, and all that, right? So how do they use it? Um, one of the ways it's used is to give you it's, it's more of like a and, and, and please correct me if I'm answering this the wrong way or I'm Mr. Mr. misinterpreting the question. But anyway, so my understanding is, for example, uh, the university gets to use it or Coursera gets to use it to give you recommendations on what sites on what uh, other courses to actually take uh, take on it helps you there's some there's some platforms i'm forgetting the name of one of them it actually helps you uh, uh, interact with the system, do the exams, do the assignments in there, and based on how you get to answer the questions and, and the time you take to answer those questions, it's actually able to 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 help you improve on a particular that particular subject. Yeah, another way it's using the education system, especially from from a, from a technical point of view is the uh, automatic grading of uh, of, of exams and, uh, and assignments and. and um, and, and cuts and all that. So that's 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 how I look at it. So I look at it from a platform point of view. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Uh, for that. That was really nice. Thank you. Good. So at this point, you'll get to have uh, the to hear the uh, the video, and then uh, from there uh, we will call it um, a wrap up for the session. And uh, thank you so much to us. I uh, thank before to our speakers, to our attendees, and to everyone. Till we meet next time. It's been one of the most amazing advances in AI. NLP has changed a lot over the last several decades. The field has started off using primarily rule-based systems to then using probabilistic systems to now where NLP relies much more on machine learning and deep learning. In this specialization, you learn everything from being able to translate English to French, to understanding if a customer review is a positive review or a negative review, to building a customer service chatbot, to letting a user enter some text and using that to do web search or to do online product search. More recently, with the rise of powerful computers, we can now train end-to-end -end systems that would have been impossible to train a few years ago. We can now capture more complicated patterns, and we can use these models in question answering, in chatbots, and in other applications. A few years ago, these models would take weeks or even months to train. But with attention, you can train these models in just a few hours. I'm really excited for everyone to get started, to take these courses, learn these technologies, and to go build some great NLP systems. So that brings us to the tail end of our live stream webinar today. And once again, thank you so much. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
can maybe if you could just end the share. <clears throat>